Chapter One of In a North Country Village by M. E. Francis. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In a North Country Village by M. E. Francis. Chapter One Thornley. We hear so much nowadays about the difficulties of agriculture the increasing number of unlet farms, the exodus of the labourer, the fall of prices and the growing spirit of radicalism, that we have come to think the typical British rustic, honest farmer John Bull, as much a product of a bygone age as his once familiar red waistcoat and top boots. On the other hand, the population of our large towns overflows their slums and alleys, and rows of hideous, ill-built houses start up on their outskirts, and creep out further and further into the country, until the fair green face of the land is seamed and disfigured by a very network of staring red brick. When one unduly prolongs one's walks or drives in these populous districts, one wonders sometimes if the prognostications of certain mournful prophets will be realised in our days, and if our English villages, with their rugged good-humoured inhabitants, their snug homesteads, their antiquated customs will be altogether swept away. And yet, within eight miles of one of our largest northern manufacturing towns, on the main road between it and a fashionable watering place, there is a certain sleepy little hamlet that I know of, which has remained unchanged to all intents and purposes for several hundred years, and the inhabitants of which have lived there from generation to generation in undisturbed content. There is but one rambling street, if street it can be called, where the houses are of all shapes and sizes, and stand at irregular distances from each other, and from the road. If you chanced to stroll through Thornley on a summer's noontide, you would think the whole place was asleep, not even a dog in sight, except perhaps, where here and there, in a large farmyard, one may be seen blinking in the sunshine outside his kennel, with his muzzle between his outstretched paws. Even the hens cluck drowsily to their wandering broods, and the cats sit sunning themselves on the snowy doorsteps, watching with lazy upturned eyes the swallows that circle and twitter over their heads, or the amorous pigeons that walk up and down on the tiled roofs opposite, bowing and cooing and courting, as the good folk here would call it, with equal affectation and perseverance but the inhabitants of Thornley are neither absent nor asleep. Twelve o'clock is dinner-time, and they are all busy at their mate. There is a fine odour of bacon in the air just now. Bacon is the staff of life at Thornley. For breakfast in the morning, a slab or two cold and sometimes raw, between two thick slices of bread for bagging or lunch, and again, as often as not, for dinner, when the last of the Sunday beef has been disposed of cooked before the fire in a deep dish and served up smoking and savoury with taters in the gravy here and there when you pass the more important dwelling of a gradely farmer you may smell irish stew or toad in the hole but bacon is the staple food of the cottagers and they certainly seem to thrive on it look at this child who suddenly comes toddling spoon in hand from the rear of this whitewashed cottage and pauses irresolute at the sight of a stranger. There's legs for you, as Mrs. Poyser would say, and see the bare arms with their delicious roundness, and little soft rings at the wrist, the chubby face, sunburnt over its clear red and white, all save the forehead which, as the yellow curls are tossed aside, shows snowy, or no, that is too lifeless a word to express it, rather warmly, delicately white, like the outer petals of a blush rose. Is not this a good advertisement for Thornley air and Thornley bacon? Presently the school bell clangs out, and in a moment the hamlet is alive. No kiss of a fairy prince could dispel the very atmosphere of drowsiness so thoroughly and instantaneously as does the quavering, jangling summons. Here be... All the little boys and girls, with rosy cheeks and flaxen curls, and sparkling eyes and teeth like pearls, tripping and skipping. 
truly a hearty healthy merry little crew these thornley children of all ages from the mite above described who is scarcely two to the stalwart urchin in the sixth standard whose wrists have crept such a long way out of his jacket sleeves and whose feet in their hobnail shoes make such a terrible clatter over the cobblestones that is the boy who put a live eel into the schoolmistress's letter-box one morning nearly causing that short-sighted and long-suffering person to have a fit when she put in her hand in search of her correspondence tommy was at once detected and desired to hold out his hand which he did observing philosophically that he might as well be it for something as nothing the little girls run past dropping a hasty one-sided dip as they recognise an acquaintance their little round rosy faces are still shining from their recent scrub in the back kitchen their missus is that particular and the boys follow more slowly for they are whipping their tops as they go tops are in fashion this summer i perceive there is a fashion in village games which changes almost with the seasons last year the favourite playthings were miniature carts constructed very ingeniously out of old boxes the wheels being made of disused cotton reels and the year before they were still simpler consisting merely of round pieces of tin the lids of biscuit boxes chiefly with a hole in the middle through which a long piece of string was passed how gleefully the owners trundled and twirled them and what a hideous din they made and how unpleasant it was when one came whirling round you entangling itself in your petticoats and wrapping your shins there the last of the boys has gone a little brown-faced lad who rolls along with his hands in the pockets of his shirt corduroys kicking up the dust as he walks and shouting out contemptuous comments on the achievements of the top whippers human nature is the same all over the world i am inwardly convinced that this urchin is topless the children are no longer in sight but i can hear them still the boys shouting and cracking their whips the girls playing in the road outside the schoolhouse for the bell has not yet stopped and the last precious moments of liberty must be made the most of here we go round the mulberry bush the mulberry bush the mulberry bush here we go round the mulberry bush this fine and frosty morning they shout the ditty in little breathless gusts and even at this distance i can hear the shuffle of their dancing feet the bell is silent at last and there is a general rush and scamper then all is still not for long though the hour of repose is over and work begins again there is a pushing back of chairs and benches and a clatter of crockery within the houses a tramp of heavy footsteps a slouching past of burly forms without here comes mr waring one of the most important personages of thornley a gradely farmer as one can see at the first glance all our farmers are fat and the more prosperous they are the fatter they grow his broad shining rubicund face wreathes itself in smiles as he approaches good afternoon mrs francis fine weather that is we could do with a drop of rain though to swell the potatoes evidently mr waring's hay is carried it did rain a little this morning didn't it no but a spot or two and we are no more while the wind's in yon quarter well good day mr waring i'm glad to have seen you it's some time since we've met i began to be afraid your gout was troubling you again nay ma'am i've kept pretty clear o that lately but it's been busy times with me i've been getting there in you see and burying my father and that he touches his huge mushroom-shaped chip hat and rolls on leaving me a little taken aback at the piece of information thus casually conveyed not indeed that i was surprised at the manner of the announcement for the thornley folks are not as a rule given to sentiment but i am rather astonished to hear that mr waring so recently possessed a papa he himself having been a grandfather for some time a few steps more bring one out into the open fields that stretch away brown and green or rather golden in the sunshine to their boundary of distant sand hill the broad expanse has a certain beauty of its own 
in spite of its flatness and monotony on the right is a half-cut meadow the rich heavily scented swathes lying in the foreground while a little further off the mowing machine a new one brilliantly scarlet and blue flashes out against the young green of the wood the straw hat and bright coloured shirt of the driver adding to the picturesque effect the sudden ejaculation oh behind the hedge on my left makes me start the termits are being earthed up and a stalwart labourer is in the act of turning his plough at the end of a drill his sunburnt face is uplifted for a moment in greeting the sleek sides of his elephantine horse gleam through the green thorn boughs there is a further bellow gee back accompanied by an oath or two merely used in the way of persuasion and then up the furrow they go patiently plodding the little village as i look back at it has suddenly become alive with rustic figures men returning to work women going in and out of their houses the loose sleeves of their print jackets or bed gowns rolled up high on their arms their short striped petticoats leaving their sturdy ankles exposed to view chickens are being fed pigs done for then there is the washing up and a thousand odd jobs to be seen to the blue smoke curls up merrily farmer waring was right it will not rain to-day here and there linen gleams out on hedges or clotheslines though most of the thrifty thornley housewives have got their wash out of the way before this these lines of white with the women's bedgowns and aprons and the yellow corn ricks which seem positively to blaze in the sunlight are vivid points of colour in a picture which is otherwise blended of sober hues house walls for the most part of time-worn stone quarried from the delf yonder roofs of thatch or antique slabs of stone lichen grown and irregularly set here a cottage of brick the red of which however is softened and mellowed by years there one with walls washed over the ochre yonder stands the ivy-grown church placidly keeping watch over a goodly company of gravestones this village churchyard is to my thinking the epitome of tranquillity and even beauty of a certain sober kind it seems to me that the church casts its shadow lovingly across the graves caressing each in turn for all who lie there have in life been gathered to its embrace many and many a time flowers bloom above the sleepers in abundance old-fashioned and simple as themselves for the village children make a garden of this place and many a wreath of wild flowers is woven by willing little fingers many a fern and flowering bulb is eagerly and often inefficiently planted to blossom and wither and be replaced there is a special watering pot kept in the school porch which they call the deading can because it is reserved for watering the graves the fresh voices of the little ones mingle with the music of the birds in the neighbouring woods the sweep of scythes the clatter of reaping and mowing machines the slow heavy tread of sleek farm horses all the thousand and one blithe sounds that gladden the heart of the rustic one would think these rude forefathers of the hamlet must find it sweet to rest here under the pure air of heaven with the sun to shine on them and the grasshoppers to chirp above them and the little children to prattle near when i first knew thornley the cannon was alive he lies yonder now under the green sod on the spot where he so often stood to greet his parishioners as they entered or left the church no picture of the place would be complete without at least an outline of that familiar figure familiar indeed it was in thornley there was not a man woman or child in the place in whom he did not interest himself and whose every idiosyncrasy was not known to him the people considered it quite a matter of course that he should concern himself as much with their affairs as with his own eh they would say among themselves cannon will be glad to hear as our bill's doing so nicely or cannon will be fair broken-hearted when he gets to know polly's goings on and it is only fair to say that these homely joys and sorrows were matters of the deepest moment to him nothing could be done in thornley without the canon's intervention 
sometimes he would be seen teaching a young mother how to hold and dandle her first baby and sometimes assisting an inexperienced nurse in making a sick bed now looking in on old billy prescott the keeper who was recovering painfully from his last spree and recommending fearlessly a hair of the dog that bit him to the nervous miserable man a prescription be it said which called forth a good deal of argument on the part of billy's dame and now sternly reprimanding a pair of youthful lovers whom he caught billing and cooing under a hedge when they should have been at sunday school this courting or company keeping was a sore point with the canon beginning as it usually did among lads and lasses who had only just left school and being continued till they were quite old enough to know better the canon left no stone unturned in his efforts to combat the amative proclivities of his flock when the boys and girls had outgrown that stage in which he could settle the matter by boxing their ears or complaining to their parents or when there was no apparent reason for prolonging the wooing of more staid and well-to-do parties or even when a match between a certain couple was considered likely by the neighbours and advisable by himself he was uncompromising and insistent in advocating matrimony if saucing and remonstrating in private did not produce the desired result he would throw out a hint or two on sundays before the assembled congregation it's quite time for that couple i met walking in the woods last night to be married or if certain people who don't live a hundred miles away from here intend to be united before lent their bands must be called next sunday and strange to say in all probability the couple in question were shouted on the appointed day if they still hung back the canon generally let them know what he thought of them in the few words with which it was his custom to preface his ordinary sunday discourse when any members of his congregation stood in special need of pulling up those few words were terrible things especially as the speaker used occasionally to detect people in the act of complacently fitting the cap on the guilty parties whereupon he added another phrase or two to remind these censorious ones of their little weaknesses ending not infrequently with a sweeping condemnation of thornley and its ways in general woe betide any one else however who ventured in his presence to say a word against thornley or thornley folk the people liked him none the less for his occasional severity eh hasn't cannon been barging awful this morning they would ask of each other with a roll of the head and a jerk of the thumb over the shoulder but on the whole they preferred being barged at to being let alone on the same principle presumably as that which causes them and their kind to think nothing of a doctor who does not order nauseous draughts and, and bitter pills but if the canon was zealous and unflinching in the performance of his duty he knew how to temper justice with mercy many of the thornley folk will wipe their eyes as they tell you of that cold winter's night some years ago when poor owd gillifer jack was sent by his crony the blacksmith to fetch home a quantity of old iron bolts and chains which the latter had bought at a recent sale poor jack met a friend on the way and they had an odd jill a very odd jill together after which the friend went his way and jack went his which in some unaccountable manner led him into a ditch there the canon found him half suffocated and but partially sober and after much difficulty extricated him and set him on his legs but perceiving that jack was only just capable of carrying himself and could in no way have proceeded if encumbered with his burden the canon took up the load himself off they set the canon staggering and gasping for breath and jack staggering too and occasionally lurching against his companion so violently that the chains jingled again and at other times making such a swerve in the other direction that the canon thought he was going to take a header into the ditch once more in his anxiety he shifted his load to one shoulder and passing the other arm through jack's so as to enable him to maintain his equilibrium in some degree they proceeded onwards in a curious zigzag fashion until they came to the village here the canon was for taking leave of his protege but jack having now reached the affectionate stage of intoxication refused to part with him until he had seen him safe at home 
he poured forth indeed so many loving if somewhat indistinct remonstrances in so loud a key that presently the whole village assembled anxious to see what mac a drunken chap jack a jillifers had gotten out of and much surprised they were to find their own pastor in jack's tipsy embrace blushing with discomfiture and sorely exhausted by his evening's work jillifer jack was not the only member of the congregation who was anxious to act as escort on occasion to the good priest his cousin john rutherford ned's joe used to consider it his special privilege to see canon homer nights if the latter were returning by train from some distant expedition he would be sure to find joe waiting for him at the station and the servants at the hall or any of the neighbouring houses where he occasionally dined were quite accustomed to joe's vigorous thump at the back door and the subsequent announcement that he had come for canon it was however the sick and infirm of his flock who made the largest demands on the canon's time he would prescribe for them and comfort them listen to their long accounts of their symptoms inspect their bad legs and compassionate their sore fingers with untiring patience and kindness then as to his spiritual ministrations the persevering exhortations to some the quiet word in season to another the mere comfort of his presence in a death chamber where he would kneel for hours by the poor bedside clasping the inert hands in his while the fast glazing eyes were turned towards him until they could see no more one should hear the thornley folk tell of these things a poor girl lay dying of consumption once in the village a farm servant and a stranger there was no one belonging to her to attend to her or to mourn for her and her mistress though she did for her with a certain rough kindness was too busy to be much comfort to her the canon therefore considered it incumbent upon him to spend many hours of each day with her towards the end of her illness it was the poor creature's one joy to hear him pray beside her the lord's prayer pleased her best and to gratify her he repeated it dozens and dozens of times sometimes when she lay absolutely still with closed eyes he would fancy that the monotonous sound had sent her to sleep and tried to creep away unperceived but she would stretch out a feeble hand and whisper a request for one more our father and then the canon would kneel and begin again a very litany until his voice was broken with fatigue and his dry tongue clove to his palate who knows i might want a prayer myself when i'm dying he said when someone remonstrated with him she passed away at last and was forgotten and it was not until the canon's own last illness came that this circumstance was recalled to the mind of his people for when it became patent that their beloved friend and master was to be taken from them the children knelt by scores about his door and in the adjoining church and their elders joined them by relays and prayed from morning till the late summer dusk all day long the sound of children's voices was wafted in through the open window of the room where the canon lay preparing for his great journey and curiously enough the prayer chosen by the little ones the music of which accompanied him to the very threshold of eternity was the our father end of chapter one chapter two of in a north country village by emmy francis this librivox recording is in the public domain gaffer's child about a half mile from the village proper is a certain neat white cottage standing in its own potato plot and surrounded by fields this was inhabited for many years by an old couple their only daughter and an elderly labourer a lodger whose small but regular weekly payments eked out their tiny income the father and mother middleton by name shortened for convenience sake into the less aristocratic but more suggestive title of midden were both deprived of the use of their limbs and passed the greater part of their lives in large elbow chairs on either side of the fireplace after betsy their daughter had washed and dressed them of a morning she and the lodger shifted them from the bed with its blue check curtains to these 
and then the lodger straightened his back and nodded at them and reckoned they'd do and went off to his work and betsy when she'd finished her scrubbing and cleaning up in the house betook herself to the garden and all day long the old pair sat and stared at each other from opposite sides of the hearth for the most part in silence though sometimes they compared ailments and sometimes they had a little quarrel one day tom middleton died and then there was only one old body to wash and dress and seat by the fire. When they carried her out of her room as usual, the first morning after her husband's funeral, Mrs. Midden turned her head and looked about her. What's getting feathers cheer? It's yonder, a side of the dresser, answered Betsy, growing suddenly a little pink about the eyes. Then fetch it out and set it where it allus was. So the empty chair was placed in its former place and the old woman sat and looked at it, day after day, till one morning she too was shifted for the last time, and Betsy put both chairs against the wall. Poor Betsy was alone in the world now, and cried a great deal in consequence, and sat for hours with her apron over her head. But presently she began to recover herself, and to take comfort in the thought that as it was to be, it had happened before her blacks were worn out. If it had but a been the Lord's will to a took her at the same time as feyther, we needn't had but the one burying, she remarked with a sob. Ah, said Ned Gill, the lodger, but you see, things never falls out the way we stab them, if we'd ought to say to them, and the Almighty no doubt knows best. It might a come more expensive in the long run. Eh, that's true, assented Betsy, and then she gave honest Ned his dinner in a handkerchief and told him he'd best be trotting. Betsy at this time was about forty-two, short, stout, and hard-featured enough, though she had very kindly blue eyes, and a bright good-humoured smile. She and Neddy Gill were excellent friends, and neither of them saw any reason why she should not continue to do for him now as she had for the last ten years. She was therefore considerably startled and annoyed when one morning the canon, alarmed for the proprieties, suggested that under existing circumstances it would be as well for her to look out for another lodger what for said betsy pausing with her foot on the spade she had been earthing up her potatoes and looking round with a puzzled face well you see betsy you're a single woman and living quite alone it's not quite nice to have a man lodging here you'd better try to find a woman or a married couple to stay with you if you must let lodgings it would be much pleasanter for you too. You would have company all day long, you know. I do not want no more company nor what I have, returned Betsy stolidly. I couldn't be moided with folks in the house in the daytime, and I couldn't do with women at all. I've me work to do, inside and out, and no time for aught else. And arter Ned takes his breakfast in the morning, he's out on the road all day, and of an evening I've got used to see him sitting in a corner smoking his pipe. Here Betsy spat in her hands and turned over another shovelful of earth. Well, but, Betsy, ah, I've got used to Neddy, you see, and I reckon he's used to me, she interrupted, glancing up again. We's do very well, Canon, thank ye. Well, Betsy, in that case, don't you think you and Ned had better be married? Betsy plied her spade with great vigour and made no answer. You see, urged the Canon, you really might just as well. It would make very little difference to either of you, and would stop people from talking. Besides, it would be nice for you to feel that you were no longer alone in the world, and to have someone to take care of you and work for you. Betty drove her spade slowly into the ground, and rested her foot on it once more. Ah, she said calmly, that's true enough. I never thought of that before. Well, Canon, I reckon you'd best speak to Ned. I haven't got no objections. The canon withdrew in some amusement, and Betsy went on with her work. An hour or two later, Ned's well-known slow step was heard on the path, but instead of proceeding straight to the house as he usually did when he returned of an evening, he went up to her and stood beside her. Have you seen canon? inquired Betsy without looking up. Ah, returned Ned. Well, said Betsy. Well, I've no to gin it. Ah, well, neither have I. It'll not make such a deal of difference, neither, as Canon says. 
ned stood for a moment or two contemplating the sturdy figure of his future helpmate with a queer half-puzzled smile on his weather-beaten face then he observed that he had told canon he might as well shout them next sunday you did did ye returned betsy sounds like business that she suddenly straightened herself and handed neddy the spade with an engaging smile sin that's how it's to be she observed you might as well finish the taters a happier couple than betsy and neddy gaffer as she called him it would be hard to find there was but one drawback to their bliss theirs was the fate of the proverbial king and queen in the old fairy tales they had no children this was perhaps scarcely to be surprised at a fact which betsy frequently endeavoured to impress upon her spouse where d'ye suppose we'd find childer at our time o' life she would ask him a little impatiently ye should a wed before if ye'd wanted that mak o work ah that's true enough lass gaffer would reply but eh i'd be proud if we was to have a little un of our own a pretty little thing wi rosy cheeks as ud come run into the gate when i'd be coming warm of an evening eh you're not but an owd foo betsy would say in rather shaky tones though a pretty un too it's likely i'm sure why didn't you think of that before and tack up with some gradely young lass twenty or thirty year ago you'd a had childer enough by this i'd up owd thee ah happen i would ned would assent and yet missis i doubt if any young lass ud do for me and that the same way as you i've nought again you at all missis nay nought anyway i've been as comfortable as i'd ever ax to be so there wretch me the bacco we say no more about it betsy felt that this was very handsome on ned's part and his tolerance made her regret more than ever her inability to gratify him on the particular point in question she allowed her husband henceforth various small latitudes against which she had hitherto set her face such as the keeping of a dog though that as she frequently observed was a mac crater she never could abide she also permitted him to fill the house with neighbours children as often as he fancied enduring good-humouredly enough the noise they made and the strew and general disorder in her tidy kitchen in time indeed she herself grew fond of their little visitors and sometimes when she saw her gaffer with a flaxen-haired mite on his knee or prepared a jam butty for some small petitioner whose chubby hands clung to her skirts and whose laughing eyes were raised roguishly to hers honest betsy would heave a deep sigh of regretful longing it is not very often that in such cases as this a demand creates a supply indeed as a young irish friend remarked in my hearing once it's always the best mothers who have no children but curiously enough the intense wish of the good couple was gratified after many years in a quite unexpected manner it happened that in a certain country town five or six miles from thornley a little stranger made its appearance finding no welcome ready for it and indeed being considered very much in the way the father had emigrated and was not to be heard of the mother a servant and a simple foolish young thing was far from home and kindred it would have fared badly with her had she been cast adrift but her mistress who was much attached to her consented to keep her if the baby could be satisfactorily disposed of this charitable lady therefore consulted a friend of hers who consulted the canon who consulted mrs gill who consulted ned and the result was general jubilation it'll be gaffer's child said betsy i left it to him to settle and he's all for tackin' it but the only fear is canon if the mother goes and takes it from us just as we're getting fond on it it'll go near to break his heart i don't think you need to fear that said the canon the poor creature is only too thankful to get rid of it and her mistress promises to see that she pays for its keep regularly eh well that'll be a very good job too i dunnot say as the money won't come in responded thrifty betsy and so the matter was settled the day before the baby took up its abode with its foster parents gaffer ned walked up to thornley hall and after a little preliminary beating about the bush inquired with a bashful grin if there mightn't be such a thing as an owd cradle of some mac or other to be bestowed for the asking well there was a cradle 
which the last occupant had outgrown and of which she had taken possession for her dolls but with a little persuasion she was induced to part with it sheets blankets and counterpane were hunted up and it was presented to ned to see his face when the befrilled and beribboned bassinet was brought down his eyes positively shone with rapture and his mouth pursed itself up into a comical expression of admiring satisfaction then the reverence with which he took hold of it the care with which he carried it almost as though already a baby face lay on the lace-trimmed pillow his way lay through the village and as he marched along with his burden a good many sly jokes were made at his expense but brave old neddy held on his way stoutly and good-humouredly turning his jolly wrinkled face over his shoulder now and then to respond to some neighbour's sally or to utter a witticism of his own he was so happy he was as ready to laugh as any of them next day betsy donned her best garments and went to fetch the baby which was delivered over to her by its temporary nurse with much satisfaction gaffer went to meet her as she returned and insisted on taking possession of the child while his wife trudged joyfully beside him carrying its little wardrobe and its bottle when they got indoors ned sat down carefully and with big eager trembling fingers unfolded the little one's wraps gazing for some moments in silence at the placid face missus come here he whispered presently to betsy who was tacking off her things at the other side of the room she drew near smiling the infant's tiny hands clasped gaffer's great horny forefinger eh owd lass the almighty's good said ned we ain't got a little un o we're own at last it was pleasant to see betsy assume the airs and importance of a mater familius of long standing to see her dandle the infant and pat it on the back and administer cinder tea on occasion and to hear her discuss with other matrons its ailments the teeth which according to her it began to breed at the age of about six weeks the notice which it already took and various other points of equally absorbing interest all this was pleasant enough but it was still more delightful to see gaffer with the child he got up half an hour earlier in the morning that he might have time to assist at its toilet before going to his work and would stand watching its ablutions with intense interest his face wrinkled up into the funniest mixture of pride and anxiety dunnot she come on wonderful betsy would say sustaining the pink morsel in the basin with one hand over which the helpless little head drooped and bobbed in the effort to sustain itself she do bless her little heart neddy would answer with modest triumph one day the baby crowed and kicked in the water for the first time and the old couple fell a-laughing until they were obliged to wipe the tears of ecstasy from their eyes and sometimes she cried and then ned sternly reprimanded betsy and wanted to know what she was about to let the poor child break its heart like that without doing something for it he would hurry home in the evening putting away his tools with all speed and polishing his hands on the legs of his trousers now missus he would call out and over and betsy nothing loath handed over the child to be cuddled and dandled and sung to at least as she sometimes explained to her neighbours gaffer doesn't exactly sing for he can't but he makes a kind of noise and he's pleased and she's pleased and so all's reet meanwhile the child grew and throve amazingly the weekly pension was paid regularly but the mother never once came to see her unnatural i call it observed betsy and then with a sigh half jealous half relieved well happen it's all for the best just as little polly was nine months old and had begun to lisp dada and to spring and wriggle in betsy's arms when she heard ned's step news came to the white cottage which plunged its inhabitants into desolation polly's mother had got into bad ways and her mistress said she could no longer keep her and she was bent on going to london and worse than all on taking baby polly with her i knowed how it ud be sobbed betsy didn't i tell ee murmured gaffer in a choked voice and after a pause turning to the woman a friend of polly's mother who had been sent to make the announcement and to fetch the child nay but ye might tell her as we do not all to the bit o money coming regular if it's that as she's got in her head 
we'd be fain to keep the little un for naught. Tell her that, and tell her as she needn't fear, but it'll be well done to, and, and, with a sob, the missus and me will be fair heartbroken to part with it. The friend was quite sure of that, and very sorry, but it couldn't be helped. The mother wanted her child, and she had promised to fetch it. So if Mrs. Gill wouldn't mind putting its bits of things together, she'd like to be going. Mrs. Gill, after many expostulations and reproaches, was obliged to comply, and at last the bundle was tied up, and the baby received tearful farewell embraces from her foster parents. But events proved that they had counted without this baby. She had submitted placidly enough to be bonneted and cloaked and wept over, but when it came to be handed over to a strange woman and carried down the road, leaving Dada and Mammy standing by the gate, it was quite another matter. Polly displayed an energy and determination which no one had hitherto given her credit for. She screamed, she kicked, she fought, like a little soldier, as Betsy subsequently remarked with great pride. She doubled herself up and turned black in the face, and finally, when everything else failed, prepared to go into convulsions. When it came to this, her new acquaintance hurried back and almost flung her into Betsy's arms. "'Take her, for God's sake!' she cried. "'I'll have no more to do with her. She'll be dead before I carried her halfway.' If her mother wants her, let her come and fetch her herself. But the mother did not come. Whether her friend's account of the gill's unwillingness to part with Polly, and Polly's unwillingness to part with them, had touched or frightened her, did not transpire, but the honest couple were after this left in undisturbed possession of their treasure. The fact that from that day forward they never received a penny for its keep rather increased than diminished their satisfaction. Two years passed very uneventfully, and Polly had become one of the prettiest children in the neighbourhood of Thornley. Many of the neighbours shook their heads over the idolatrous worship of the honest couple for their little prattling, sunny-headed nursling. "'I never did all with spiling a child that gate," one wise matron would observe to another. "'Ned's fair silly about yon, and Betsy's nigh as bad. And when you come to think, you know, what it is and where it's come from.' Yeah, the other would respond. I hope they mayn't be laying up disappointment for the cells. I doubt it'll not come to much good, no more nor its mother. As Alice a deal of trouble we childer for that Mac as didn't ought to live at all. No baby princess, however, could have been considered of more importance, or in her own way more tenderly nurtured than this poor little waif that didn't ought to a lived at all. And when she said her prayers at Betsy's knee or slept with smiling lips and chubby folded hands, she really looked quite as good and innocent as a child need be. It was wonderful, the neighbours said. One warm Sunday afternoon, Ned was sitting in the doorway smoking his pipe, Betsy being established a little farther within the house, spelling out the weekly Mercury, which was her staple Sunday literature. Polly was taking a little nap in an impromptu bed composed of the two armchairs once used by Betsy's parents. A Sabbath stillness was reigning everywhere. All the churchgoers and lovers and Sunday school children were out on the road, and the silence was only broken by the trill of a lark circling downwards just within the range of Ned's vision, and the hum of bees. Ned followed the motions of the lark with tranquil enjoyment, puffing luxuriously at his pipe the while, and when the bird's song suddenly ceased, as, after completing its final circle, it darted to earth, his eyes, descending also, encountered those of a stranger standing by his gate. Dark eyes they were, weary and anxious-looking, yet with a latent fierceness in them, which somehow startled Ned. But when the girl spoke, it was in a gentle and timid voice. Would ye kindly give me a drink of water? I've walked a long way, and I'm tired. Ah, come in, do, and rest ye a bit, responded Ned, removing the pipe from his mouth. We mun find ye summat better than water, though. The missus'll be getting the tay in two or three minutes. Come in and sit ye down. The girl opened the gate and entered, dragging her feet in their dusty, ill-made boots the high heels of which had been worn quite crooked, in a way which betokened extreme fatigue. 
her crimson skirt was draggled and covered with dust and her dark hair though dressed in the height of the fashion was rough and untidy betsy eyed her with some disfavour and reckoned she'd best set her chair nigh the door where to be cooler but the strange girl stepped past her into the little kitchen and peered about curiously it's a snug little place she said do you live here all alone you two betsy was at first disposed to be offended at the freedom of the question but her heart softened as she glanced at the visitor she was no but a slip of a lass after all who knew no better poor thing she did look pale too and tired her eyes were quite wild all alone echoed betsy drearily no but the child the child ah there she lays yonder nay see she's wackened up at this moment in truth a little ruffled flaxen head reared itself over the back of one of the chairs and a drowsy voice called mammy the visitor stood as if turned to stone but no stone was ever of such a hue as suddenly overspread those cheeks of hers if they'd been white before they were red enough now eh hey, my pretty lamb cried betsy who at this moment had no eyes for anything but the child come then come wacken up and show their bonny face polly who'd been vigorously rubbing her eyes with her chubby little fists held out her arms now with a sleepy smile blinked a great deal and made some rather incoherent remark in tones still husky from her recent slumber now then said betsy brimming over with motherly pride come and say good arternoon pretty there's a good lass she carried her over to the visitor who turned with what seemed a little effort and looked at the child fixedly she is a bonny little thing she said and paused she has got blue eyes i see she continued adding with a sort of defiant glance at her hostess i always notice eyes first nay but look ye here cried betsy offended as the other moved a little away without admiring half polly's points see her legs and these ere little arms as mottled and as firm feel of em the girl clasped them for a moment and then loosed her hold colouring again all over her face i can't bear to look at her she said i had a, a sister with blue eyes once ah and she's dead i reckon said betsy commiseratingly yes long since there is no one belonging to me now well sit you down and we'll have tea directly run to dada polly polly toddled off on her little unsteady legs shouting as ned caught her up in his arms to kiss and tickle her you look old folk to have such a young child said the visitor suddenly ah more like a grandfather and grandma i doubt said betsy with a jolly laugh but she isn't our child you see really though yet in a way she is how's that betsy nothing loath to tell a tale in which she took never-failing delight recounted polly's history while she bustled about preparing for tea dwelling especially on the little un's amazing cleverness in declining to return to her unnatural parent when i tell you that she was living for nine months within a few miles of the child and niver come next or nigher a nice life of it the poor lamb would have had with her perhaps said the girl absently for she was watching the little leaping crowing figure in gaffer's arms perhaps the poor creature was ashamed pooh cried betsy setting her arms akimbo and looking as if she could say something very sarcastic if she chose ashamed indeed here gaffer come to your tea gaffer came in carrying polly whom he seated on his knee and regaled with a drink out of his saucer the tea having been previously cooled with much blowing. "'Well, whichever way it is, I'm reet thankful to keep the little un,' resumed Betsy, when she had attended to the wants of her guest. "'Gaffer and me wouldn't know what to do with ourselves without her.' "'The mother might turn up some day yet, and, and want her back, though,' said the stranger, stooping to pick up her spoon which she had dropped. "'Nay,' said Gaffer, "'I do not think she will. I really do not we never had a word nor a line for two year very near and if she did come back ah if she did well then 
the missus and me as it settled between us to mak out a terrible bill for the keep of the child you see we never had a penny since she was nine month old and we'll mak out such a bill for food and clothes and our trouble you know we minding her as she'll never be able to pay so then we'll say as we mun keep the child till she does here gaffer winked across the table at his missus and leant back in his chair chuckling at his own foresight and sagacity that's our plan you see he added bending down to poke a little bit of tea-cake into polly's expectant mouth is that your plan said the stranger looking full at him well it may be a good one for you but i think it's cruel hard on the mother the child's hers after all and no matter how low she may have fallen she has the best right to it the very beasts love their young ones you know well but see now said gaffer earnestly look at this child would ye ever wish to see a healthier or a bonnier one an ark to her saying a little prayers and hymns and that eh hey, the missus have brought her up wonderful we reckon to do the best for her as ever we can she'll have her schooling and be taught her religion and when she gets a big lass and is happen thinking o getting wed we's find her a bit o' brass to help her set up house she's all be good and happy if we can mak her so you may depend on that and if her mother goes and takes her off us what'll she do wi her do you think i've nought agin her poor soul and i wish she may come to no harm gaffer said this in a tone which implied that he thought it extremely likely that she would but arter all she is but a foolish bit of a thing who couldn't keep straight when she had the chance given to her what sort of training would she give the poor child it's well if she didn't make her just such another as herself nay nay we're either eat to keep the poor innocent from her if we can the girl did not answer but her eyes were cast down and there was a curious look on her face now polly said ned let's hear you say grace eh she does say it so nice hark to her now polly's two little hands were somewhat forcibly joined and she lisped out an infantile version of a grace after meat with many gasps and stops and not a few promptings her blue eyes roving round the table the while ned beamed with pride and triumph and was loath to allow the performance to end even with the amen let's have a neat prayers now ye'll never believe in a rapturous aside how wonderful she says em polly drawing a very long breath started off at a brisk canter through the our father adding eagerly and impatiently god best dada and mammy god best me and make me a good it lass that's all was that indeed all does she never say a prayer for her mother cried the girl speaking in a strange harsh voice and rising from a chair i mean her own mother do you never make a pray for her well you see returned betsy we ain't got to look on her as our own i may say i reckon we didn't make much count of the mother poor creetur and happen when all's said and done it's best not to be naming her to the innocent child oh you are hard folks exclaimed the stranger passionately you are cruel folks oh my god it's a hard cruel world you might have let the child pray she stopped and choked with sobs and suddenly snatching polly from ned's arms kissed her fiercely and rushed out of the house as soon as the good couple had in some measure recovered from their astonishment they rushed to the door but the shabby figure was already out of sight eh what macker wenches yon cried betsy gazing at her husband in great perturbation eh poor misfortunate thing i reckon she's in trouble i misdoubt me so she's not much good poor creature happen she and our polly's mother is a pair nay missus groaned gaffer i doubt they're one we'n been a pair of fools missus that's what it is yon poor lass is our polly's mother herself but she's left the child stammered betsy after a pause for good yes she had left the child for good end of chapter two
Chapter Three of In a North Country Village by M. E. Francis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Celebrities. A village community is much like any other community when all said and done, to use a phrase common in Thornley. Births and weddings, illnesses and deaths, partings and homecomings take place at rarer intervals, no doubt, than in more populous places, and everybody knows everything about everybody else, and sometimes a good deal more than there is to know. But after all, the broad lines of life are the same in a village as elsewhere, and human nature is human nature all the world over. Thornley, quiet and easy-going as it is, is not altogether behind the age either. Indeed, its tiny stage has been the scene of many curious dramas, and it has numbered among its inhabitants some that would be notabilities anywhere. Not so long ago there was a saint in Thornley, a genuine saint, called Peter Murphy. As his name betokens, he was an Irishman, though he had lived in the village long enough to be no longer looked on as an interloper. A tall, emaciated old man, with long grey hair and very blue eyes, and a drop at the end of his nose, at all times and in all weathers, which was called by the irreverent holy water. He had revelations and spiritual consolations, and wrestlings with the evil one, and always carried a long bone rosary which he would lovingly finger during every spare moment he could snatch from his work. Once, when Peter was ill, the rosary disappeared, a fact which he announced with mingled ire and triumph. Someone weakly suggested that the old woman who did for him might have hidden it somewhere in dusting and tidying, but he dismissed the notion with scorn. Not at all, he said, not at all, it's thou old boy. I know that very well, jerking his thumb over his shoulder with an unpleasantly significant gesture, but I'm up to his thricks, ha! I'll be even with him, I'll settle him. The methods which Peter made use of in the conflict never transpired, but that he ultimately came off victorious was demonstrated by the reappearance of the bades, which thenceforth he wore for greater security round his neck. His chief delight was to beguile the canon into a theological discussion, and it was fine to hear him laying down the law putting forward one abstruse thesis after another, and generally crushing his adversary with a reference to Pope Celestinus, whose authority he considered conclusive. Once, and only once, did Peter's holy calm desert him, and that was during certain elections which took place when home rule first began to be the question of the hour. All poor old Peter's national instincts asserted themselves, and he became as wildly excited as the most enthusiastic Parnellite of the present day. He even fell foul of his clergy, whose political views did not coincide with his own, and meeting the priest one day, accused him sternly of voting for Herod, an outburst of which he subsequently repented, acknowledging in bitterness of spirit that the election was a snare. The village poetess is of the same nationality as Peter, and shares his political views and his partiality for fine words. She disposes her shawl about her shoulders. She prostrates on her bed, but it is when the mood for versifying seizes her that she shows of what she is really capable. Her genius chiefly displays itself in the composition of dirges, one of which goes the round of the village after any melancholy event and once she was inspired to write a plea for the disestablishment of the Church of England, a terrible paper this, abounding in exhortations to gory tyrants, and in references to clanking chains. It is a thing to remember when the authoress recites one of these masterpieces, swaying her body to and fro, and making sweeping gestures, her eye meanwhile in fine frenzy rolling, and her voice growing louder and more impassioned as she warms to her subject. I can only recall two consecutive lines, however, of one effusion, a lament on the death of her beloved priest, in which regret for his loss was mingled with anxiety as to his successor. Let not his lordship the bishop think with him I mean to interfere, but I hope he'll appoint an Irishman to his evacuated chair. Apropos of frenzy, we had a real madman in Thornley once. 
we knew he'd been off it for a good bit for his wife used occasionally to lock up his hat and boots to prevent his going out and was not infrequently seen pelting him with mud in the village street o nights as a gentle means of persuading him to come home to bed but nobody heeded poor joe's vagaries and thornley was considerably startled when one morning the news flew from house to house that he was raving mad there had been sports in the squire's park on the preceding day in honour of the queen's jubilee at which every man woman and child in the place had assisted even the village radical who was wont to relate to an awe-stricken and incredulous audience how once he had walked all the way to liverpool to see her majesty and how after all when he had got there he had seen naught but a woman in black well poor joe had taken part in a tug of war and woke up next morning under the impression that it was entirely owing to his exertions that thornley had gained the day he spent the whole forenoon walking round and round in a small circle in front of the hall pausing occasionally to tug at the bell and claim his prize five pounds was the reward to which he considered himself entitled and failing that he had apparently made up his mind to gyrate on that particular spot for an indefinite period persuasions were tried then threats various small offerings were put forth to tempt him finally the squire himself came out to reason with him but joe still twirling round and round in the broiling sun remained obdurate five pounds were his deserts and five pounds he meant to have but he wouldn't mind he observed with an insinuating leer when the aforesaid teetotum performance next brought him face to face with the squire he wouldn't mind treating the young ladies to the theatre with some of it he wouldn't mind that at all he would take them himself and the squire might come too if he liked in desperation the butler had recourse to strategy and walking up to joe managed to break the magic circle slipping his arm through his and marching him off homewards pouring some apparently intensely confidential communication into the lunatic's ears as he went presently he returned jubilant with the announcement that joe was tucked up in bed quite comfortable and expecting the five pound note to arrive by post he wouldn't get out again he added as the womankind had taken away his clothes and locked him into the room but joe was not to be stopped by such slight obstacles as these he broke open the door as if it had been made of pasteboard and announced his intention of proceeding to the hall forthwith in his shirt his garments being consequently restored to him he made quite a triumphant progress through the village and enjoyed himself amazingly knocking down his papa to begin with making nothing of the latter's seventeen stone then chivying his aunt till she was obliged to take refuge in the barn and to defend herself with a pitchfork and finally betaking himself to the hall where he played peep-bow with the stablemen sent the gardeners spinning when they endeavoured to lay hands on him broke open a few doors and laid about him right and left with a stout staff all in the most light-hearted and affable manner possible at last one of the keepers had the happy inspiration of firing blank cartridges over his head whereupon joe took to his heels and fled like a hare never stopping indeed till he reached his own home and crept under the table he was ultimately secured with stout cords and his father sat opposite to him cracking a horsewhip now and then by way of soothing him until the police came to end poor joe's frolic by carrying him off to the county asylum some years ago a lad was attending thornley school who promised to render his native village celebrated in more ways than one a black-eyed rosy-cheeked rough-looking boy with nevertheless a fine artistic perception and a perfect passion for drawing had that boy been given facilities for cultivating it there is no saying what he might not have done but as it was well i must tell his story his name was johnny birch johnny or johns he was usually called to distinguish him from various kinsfolk of the same name and his father was a small farmer with a large family who looked forward eagerly to the time when his eldest son should be of age to help him in field work and thus save higher johnny's schooling was in itself a trial indeed 
Mr. Birch had gone so far as to interview the mistress on the subject. Can't he run him through them standards a bit faster? I'd be willing to pay double the fee if you'd get him through two at a time. Come now, is that a bargain? But it wasn't. The schoolmistress assured him it couldn't be done, and John Birch, John o' Joe's, retired grumbling more against book learning than ever. If the time which his son perforce employed in such matters was held by him to be wasted, one may readily infer with what patience he viewed Johnny's growing devotion to the fine arts. If I catch you at any more of that gammon, the elder John would say, driving home the lesson with a box on the ears, and Johnny Junior would jump up in a great hurry and hide away his papers. He could better endure to have his ears boxed than to see his beloved drawings turned up or burnt. In spite of the parental disapproval, he continued to draw, or to attempt to draw, everything which he saw. The canon, chancing to see some of his performances, was struck with their cleverness, and being himself no mean artist, offered to give him some lessons. John o' Joe's consent was withheld for a long time, and at last, only given on the understanding that as soon as his son had left school, all that nonsense must cease. Meanwhile, Johnny made the very best use of his time, and astonished his master by his progress. The latter, not content with verbal instruction, lent him books and drawings to study at home, and bestowed on him, moreover, a sheaf of old art papers to peruse at his leisure. Some of these contained lives of various great artists, and Johnny's eyes grew round and his face flushed as he read how many of them were poor boys like himself and began by scratching their drawings on stones, or decorating garret walls with burnt stick. The moral was obvious. Johnny too drew on stones with the point of his knife, and on whitewashed walls with charcoal of his own manufacture. Why should not he be a celebrated painter? It was very hard after this to be called upon to feed the pigs or to clean out the shippens. Day by day, he set about these tasks with more unwillingness, and day by day his father grew more displeased. As his fourteenth birthday drew near, Johnny's uneasiness increased. Though he had by no means passed all the standards, for his artistic studies somewhat lessened his zeal for the acquirement of ordinary knowledge, his father would then be free to keep him at home. His drawing lessons would cease, and he must make up his mind to lead thenceforth the life of an ordinary labourer. The boy fretted and fumed, and at last his very desperation, giving him courage, betook himself to Thornley Hall to petition the squire himself to intercede for him. If the squire would ask his father to let him be an artist, Johnny thought he would not refuse. He took with him five or six of his very finest works of art, amongst the rest a study of a fir tree, which looked as if it were cut out of green paper, and a view of his father's house, which he had done entirely by himself, and in which any little defect in perspective was atoned for by a scrupulous attention to detail. Poor Johnny handed these one by one to the squire, his heart beating very fast and his eyes glowing, and the squire wrinkled up his eyes and twisted his moustache and said, Ha ha ha! in a way which would have disconcerted any sensitive young artist very much. But Johnny's skin was of a comfortable thickness, and to his mind the drawings were beautiful. If the squire did not say much, it was probable that he thought all the more highly of them. Indeed, he told Johnny presently that he considered his work quite wonderful, considering his circumstances and opportunities, but at the same time warned him that his plans were impracticable. A great deal of hard study would be required and a good deal of expense incurred before Johnny could hope to complete his artistic education, and though no doubt a little friendly aid might be forthcoming as regarded the necessary outlay, still his father could not be expected to allow him to adopt a profession in which success was doubtful, and at best must be delayed for long years. Poor Johnny, however, pleaded so earnestly and wept so bitterly that at last the squire promised to see what he could do, and accordingly set out one Sunday afternoon, accompanied by the canon, to plead on Johnny's behalf. Mr. Birch, who was alone, the rest of the family having stepped across to a neighbour's, 
was sitting by a roasting fire in his shirt sleeves and stocking feet enjoying his pipe in the proper sunday spirit he listened to everything they urged in absolute silence well birch what do you say asked the squire after waiting patiently for a moment or two what do i say squire i say no that's what i say the lad's my lad i reckon and i'm going to have summat out of him i've been working all my life and he may work a bit now i'm not going to slave no more for him to be scribbling and messing with reds and blues he mun a done with that sort of work and so i tell ye squire there that's what i say not another word could be extracted from him and the visitors were constrained to retire the squire endeavouring to console poor johnny who was anxiously awaiting the result outside by the presence of a sovereign telling him to buy some oil colours and paint signboards in his spare time when the boy entered the house he found his father still thoughtfully smoking with his worsted clad toes extended to the blaze now lad he said i've summat to say to ye go and fetch me every one of those pictures o yours fetch em here i tell ee and dunnot stand staring as though you'd seen a boggart father you wunna pleaded poor johnny turning pale go and fetch em i tell ee cried his father thumping the table heavily with his fist or i'll fetch em myself and if i do it'll be the worse for you and fetch your pencils and paints and all the rest of that rubbish the boy obeyed slowly and tearfully and mr birch spreading out all these treasures on the table wheeled round in his chair and took his pipe out of his mouth now see you here my lad i do not want to be anyways hard on you but i mun show you who's gaffery this house squire's been here and canon's been here and what i've told em i tell you you mun ha done wi all that foolery you're getting a man now and you mun give over that nonsense i've worked hard all my life and your mother have worked hard we's be old folk in a few years and there's all that rook o little uns to do for and mostly wenches as isn't fit for much now who's to do it who's to work for feyther and mother when they ain't got too old to work for theirselves who but the oldest lad so now johnny make up your mind to it for i'll stick to it you and me'll start ploughing to-morrow and we'll be done with these things once and for all with a sudden quick gesture he swept together all johnny's cherished works of art his paint-box an old one of the cannons his little stock of pencils and paper then holding the boy off with one powerful hand he thrust them into the very heart of the glowing coals where in a few seconds all were alike destroyed johnny in an agony of sobs wrenched himself away and ran out of the house and mr birch returned to the enjoyment of his pipe and the contemplation of the fire presently his wife came in and began to make preparations for tea the small fry dropping in one by one and surrounding the table what's gone we are johnny asked mrs birch as she seated herself behind the big brown teapot on which the little folk fixed expectant eyes eh he's somewhere about answered her lord turning his chair round to the table he'll come in before he's clemmed i dare say when the meal was over however and it grew dusk the good woman began to be first angry and then anxious whatever can i come to the lad i've never known him to do such a thing as stay out till this hour if he's gone footballing in sunday clothes i'll nay he's none the lad to go footballing interrupted mr birch dunnot you bother yourself about him he's taken the sulk at summer as i've said and wunnot come in till bedtime most like it's best not to take no notice mrs birch was uneasy in her mind nevertheless and stole out after putting the children to bed creeping round the shippens and stackyard and calling softly all the time but no johnny appeared it was now nine o'clock and she became so seriously alarmed that she ran indoors shook her husband out of his nap and implored him to take a lantern and sally forth at once in search of the lad for she felt sure that something had happened to him but the father laughed at her fears and refused to budge if their johnny chose to be a fool 
let him be a fool if he didn't want to come in to his good supper and warm bed let him lie outside with an empty stomach then it had happen cool him a bit and do him good but he's got his sunday clothes on sobbed mrs birch this was the barb to the dart for her johnny to sleep out of doors was bad enough but to sleep out in his best clothes her husband only growled some inarticulate rejoinder so mrs birch reduced to the last extremity flung her apron over her head and wept johnny did not come back that night nor next day nor for many days after his mother was quite heartbroken but his father was apparently more angry than grieved he and the neighbours searched far and near john o joe's promising the lad a good thrashing when he caught him but johnny was by this time far beyond the reach of the parental arm and in spite of all efforts could not be found it was noticeable that about this time john o joe's began to wear what his neighbours called a down look and to stoop more than before and to leave off whistling at his work his temper too was shorter than ever and much sympathy was felt for poor mrs birch for it was well known that she could not indulge openly in her grief her husband having forbidden even the name of the fugitive to be mentioned in his presence one cold evening in early winter about five months after his departure all the family were assembled at tea when the latch was suddenly lifted and johnny stood hesitatingly on the threshold such a ghost of a johnny pale and thin and shorn of his thick dark locks and his clothes his sunday clothes no scarecrow of any respectability would be seen in such things mrs birch flung her arms round his neck in a passion of mingled joy and anguish and his brothers and sisters tumbled over each other in their eagerness to welcome him but his father sat still and after one steady glance at him continued to munch his bread and bacon and to gulp down his tea eh hey, feyther ain't ye niver a word for the poor lad asked mrs birch tearfully when the first greetings were over and she had leisure to observe this attitude of her master's john birch finished chewing the morsel in his mouth swallowed it and slowly extended his forefinger what's gone wi's air he inquired addressing his wife and pointing to johnny i've just come out o hospital feyther i've had a fever and then cuttin it all off answered the boy for himself ah said john senior still addressing his wife i'm glad to hear as twas but in hospital if t had been in prison as they'd done it he might spare himself the trouble o sitting down come master the lad's home at last and ye'll not go for to be hard on him he's had trouble enough i reckon ay that have a put in johnny timidly eh feyther if ye did but know the hardships i've been through ye'd forgive me ye would feyther beginning to sob cold and hunger and wet and hard words everywhere ah interrupted john it's easy seen why he's come back but why did he go what took him out of this that's what i want to know feyther i were very wicked and foolish but i was mad wi her for burning all my paints and everything i'd done and squire had give me a pound and so i i went off to london thinking i'd get work there and become a great painter and ye found you a knob at a gradely fool said his father glancing at him for the first time and ye think as i'm going to be another and welcome ye back as if ye was the best son a man could have instead of a thankless lad wi neither art nor thought for the father and mother as done everything for him i'll do no such thing ye went when ye liked and ye come back when ye liked i'm not going to say i'm glad to see ye as ye're here ye can bide but ye mun work for your mate i'll tell ye that i'm not going to keep ye in idleness now missus sit ye down and give us some more tea one of the younger children set a chair for johnny and his mother put food before him but the boy's heart was too full to permit him to eat and after endeavouring for a moment or two to choke down his sobs he buried his face in his hands and wept bitterly 
John o' Joe's pushed back his chair with a grating noise on the flagged floor and went out, and the rest of the family endeavoured to console Johnny. Being still weak and ill, exhausted by his long journey and his recent emotion, it was long before he could control himself sufficiently to relate his story, a pitiful story enough, of disappointed hopes and rudely dispelled illusions. Poor Johnny had speedily found his level in the great wilderness of London, and his aspirations were extinguished for evermore. There had been a futile struggle with pride and poverty, hunger, hardship, sickness, and finally the longing for home. He had tramped from London by slow stages, and now, oh, if his father would only forgive him, how could he ever hold up his head again if he treated him as he had done that night? Thy feyther speaks harder nor what he feels, I'll tell ee that, said Mrs. Birch. Thou mun just take no notice and he'll come round, but thou'll ha to work, lad, and no more scribbling. No, Johnny had done with scribbling for good but as he staggered up to bed, it would appear that the amount of labour to be expected from him for some time was likely to be small enough. Nevertheless, morning saw him clad in his working clothes, which he had very much outgrown by the by, and busy in the farmyard. His father gave an odd grunt when he found him at work, but otherwise did not notice him, and presently the pair sallied forth together to plough up a certain field ready for the spring sowing. Mr. Birch might have seen, had he been a little more on the alert, how feeble were the lad's steps as they plodded up and down, how pale was his face, how, in spite of the raw cold, drops of weakness stood on his brow, but he took no heed of him, beyond an occasional harsh reminder not to go asleep there, or to lift his legs a bit faster. At last, towards noonday, just as they were turning at the end of a furrow, Johnny suddenly let go the horse's head, staggered sideways with a smothered groan, and fell heavily to the ground. Then a hoarse cry was heard, and John Birch sprang forward and took the boy in his arms. Eh, my lad, my lad. A few minutes later, Mrs. Birch was startled to see her husband come staggering into the kitchen carrying Johnny whose long attenuated limbs hung apparently lifeless over his arms, while his head drooped upon his shoulder. "'Eh, hey, master, you've killed him!' cried the mother in her anguish. "'I reckon I have, lass,' answered John o' Joe's, and then he burst into tears. But Johnny was not dead, not he. He soon opened his eyes, and finding himself in his father's arms, flung out his own, and so the two hugged and kissed each other, as they had not done since Johnny was a little fellow in pinafores. Everything was made up after this, and Johnny soon got strong, and is now a strapping youth, his father's right hand, and not by any means a genius. End of chapter 3「エミ・フランシス」「This LibriVox recording is in the public domain」「ナンシー」Now then, hurry up, that's a good lad. They'll be fair clemmed i' the field if we do not make haste. It's mortal heavy, grunted Billy, the curly-pated crimson-cheeked farm boy, as he hoisted the great beer can on his shoulder and staggered down the garden path in front of his mistress. It'll be light enough when young folks has done wi' it returned Nancy, tilting her sunbonnet a little more forward, and slinging a large basket covered with a red cotton handkerchief on one sturdy arm. In a few minutes they had left the farm precincts behind, and were marching in single file along a sandy lane, bordered on either side by a ragged strip of grass, which gave way in its turn to a deep and muddy ditch. The brown waters of this were half covered with some white starred floating weed, and thickly sown with forget-me-nots and giant marsh marigolds. The air was heavy with the scent of new-mown clover, mingled occasionally, as they passed some cottage or outlying farm building, with homelier but no less pleasant odours, whiffs from the shippens, where the sweet-breathed kine were housed for the night, 
steam from the huge cauldron of soaked meal which granny gibson was preparing for her pigs a fine aroma of stable as ned muckworth slouched past with his sleek elephantine team and from the open door of the last cabin in the straggling village a smell of frizzling bacon deemed by billy so delicious that his youthful heart leapt within him eh hey, he said with a long-drawn sniff and tilting the big can dangerously backwards they'll be having bacon and taties for supper at rippenses i wish i were setting down with em i know if you dunnot mind you'll have no supper at all cried nancy sharply as she stretched out her hand to steady the can get along with your lazy bones i were but having a sniff remonstrated billy shambling on again rather quicker than before for experience had taught him that when his mistress spoke in that particular tone it was better to keep out of reach of her arm i'll gi you summat to sniff at if that's all responded nancy brandishing her fist with a threatening gesture she was a strapping lass this mistress of brook farm with not much beauty certainly except that which belongs to vigorous young and perfect health tall big-framed and buxom with a fresh white skin where sun and wind had not browned or hard work reddened it a pair of plump cheeks that might have vied with the finest apples in her orchard for rosiness bright blue eyes and abundant fair hair neatly smoothed under her gathered bonnet her gait was free and rapid her gestures decided her voice clear and ringing her tongue of the sharpest a quick-tempered keen-witted rather terrible maiden was nancy this notable wench who rented the finest farm in the place and whom half the youth of the village had courted in vain her father and mother both of ancient and respectable rustic stock had married late in life and had died when nancy the sole fruit of their union was about twenty-two nancy had duly wept for them had worn her blacks for the proper time and had now for three years ruled the farmhouse and the farm itself to the full as cleverly and profitably as her parents had done old gilbertson her father had it was said saved a tidy bit miss nancy was believed to be possessed of money untold and the village gossips thought it unhandsome of her to be so obdurate as regarded wedlock and to work and slave herself to death when she might set down and play the piano same as any lady in the land but nancy's taste did not lie in that direction she had been brought up with old-fashioned notions of thrift and duty she perfectly revelled in hard work and had a fine scorn for folks who hired slips of girls to do their business for em as if they hadn't out better to do the cells nor stitching canvas and wearing hats of a weekday walking about i their shapes the idle huzzies this last referred to the new-fangled style of dress complete with skirt and bodice now as frequently seen in the village as the bed-gown which nancy always wore on weekdays as her mother had done before her it was a far prettier garment than the ill-made gowns at present fashionable among the younger generation full and fresh and crisp with starch its lilac folds gathered in at the waist by the string of the wide linen apron it at once set off the buxom form beneath and left every movement unimpeded the short striped petticoat which met it displayed nancy's ankles clad in stout stockings of her own knitting and the well-blacked hobnailed shoes were designed evidently with a view to comfort rather than elegance nancy had as good a stock of laces and ribbons as any one in the country and a rustling silk dress or two hanging in a cupboard but she knew better than to put them on on any day but sunday presently a figure appeared walking at a brisk pace down the lane towards them a stalwart figure clad in corduroys and velveteen the bright light of the evening sun shining on hair and flowing beard till they gleamed like gold this was martin rainford one of the underkeepers the gradeliest one in the place as the village folk said a fine specimen of a countryman it must be owned not far off seven feet in his shoes and broad in proportion as he drew nearer his blond face wreathed itself in rather sheepish smiles and presently he stood stock still his gun on his shoulder evenin's warm said nancy hailing him in a matter-of-fact fashion will not you have a drop of beer was such an offer likely to be refused martin made one stride towards billy and the can tossed off a tumbler full of the amber-coloured liquid in the latter restored the glass to the boy 
wiped his mouth on his sleeve, and nodded to Nancy. "'Going warm?' inquired the latter. Martin nodded again. "'You're a great stranger now,' observed the girl with a toss of her head. "'They're pheasants,' returned Martin, speaking for the first time, and apparently struggling with an overwhelming shyness. "'They takes a dale o' looking arter they do. "'It's a fine evening. Go into their field?' Ah, we work until dark. I'm taking the lads the drinking. Good evening. Evening, echoed the taciturn Martin, striding past with the one-sided nod which appeared to be characteristic of him. Nancy almost unconsciously wheeled and looked after him. Eh, yon's a greatly chap, she said to herself with a half sigh. Yon had looked well set in the side of a body of the spring cart and atop of an airick. My word! he would be a fine sight. A few minutes' brisk walking brought Nancy and Billy to their destination, a big field which was considered the best piece of meadowland in Brook Farm. The whole of Nancy's following exerted itself on her behalf this evening, for a treacherous band of clouds marred the gorgeous yellow of the horizon, and there was a flutter and rustle among the leaves that betokened coming rain. Two great carts were being loaded at the further end of the field, and the golden pile on another, opposite the wide open gate, was being bound with ropes, preparatory to removal. The three men in charge of this last-mentioned cart were accommodated first with their portion of the contents of the basket and can, which they disposed of in prodigious gulps, and with all possible dispatch. Nancy, meanwhile, critically surveyed the result of their labours. "'Do you call that firm and proper?' she cried all at once, snatching a pitchfork from the man nearest to her, and raking down the sides of the hay mountain. Three or four tussocks of the sweet-smelling provender fell about her, to the dismay of the hirelings. "'That's your notion o' loading a cart, is it?' she pursued severely. "'Leaving mourner half the stuff i the road, enough to keep all stray cows i the parish. For shame o' ye, Tommy Treddles. You as calls yourself a man, and axes for a man's wage.' "'Eh, we hadna finish wit, missus,' expostulated Tommy, a raw and lanky youth, whose red face now peered down from the top of the load. "'What for was you throwing rope over it, then, if you hadna finished?' cried Nancy, gathering up the fallen hay with the pitchfork, and tossing it upwards with vigorous thrust to the astonished Tommy. "'There, happen ye can a heave so high as a wench, you, ow jack there, as stands gaping as though ye'd ne'er seen a pickle afore.' Now, Jimmy Norris, catch owd, a thend at throw up, and let that beer can be. There's others as wants a wet as bad as you, I reckon. Gee back, Diamond. Hurry up now, lads. There's another load i' corner as mun bide till ye come back. Diamond strained for a moment with his sleek, gigantic limbs, and then the cart went bumping out of the field, followed by Jimmy and Jack still chewing, while Tommy finished his portion of solid meat pie as he lay outstretched aloft. Nancy trudged briskly round, her sharp eyes detecting in an instant anything that was amiss, her sharp tongue admonishing and encouraging. The empty cart was trundling back after having deposited its burden at the farm, when she at length turned to go home, Billy preceding her as before. She walked at a round pace, for it was getting late. The men, in spite of the sustaining snack with which she had accommodated them, would, she knew, be hungry for their supper after their hard day's work, and that supper had yet to be prepared. They proceeded in silence, Billy relieving the tedium of the way by performing a fantasia with his knuckles on the empty beer can. Nancy, absorbed in her own thoughts, so much absorbed indeed, that it was not till she was quite close to them that she observed a couple walking slowly down the lane in front of her, a man and a woman, the man with his arm passed through the woman's, a big man, a little woman, a woman with a hat and a much befrilled and beribboned cape, a man with a yellow beard and a gun on his shoulder. So much she could see in the dusk, and it was quite enough. She passed them by without a word. "'Yon was Mester Rainford and Miss Pratt, wasn't they?' observed Billy presently, looking over his shoulder with a grin. "'Er as his lady's maid at Thall.' They're keeping company this good bit. Happen they are, returned his mistress indifferently. 
Now, Billy, my lad, give over hammering at that can, or I'll hammer your head for you to a tune as you would not like so well. Dancy's blighted affections, if blighted they were, made no difference either to her appearance or habits. Her cheeks were as rosy, her eyes as sharp, her hand as ready as ever, and she looked after her interest with greater zest, if possible, than heretofore. Haymaking was long over, and reaping and potato getting. The winter stock of coal was sinking low, and Nancy was beginning to make ready for the young lambs. When there came a spell of stormy weather, such as had not been known in these parts for nearly a score of years. Strong winds that wrenched the trees upwards by the roots, and laid the hedges flat, and snow that lay thick on the fields and was piled up in mighty drifts in lanes and out of the way corners. In the very middle of this hard weather, the foolish short-sighted little lambs began to make their appearance, and as was to be expected, after taking a disgusted survey of a very unsatisfactory world, left it again as speedily as might be. The ewes died too, many of them, and Nancy's thrifty soul was wrung within her. One bleak February morning, when the snow that had fallen during the night lay in dense whiteness over the firmer and less lovely mass beneath, Nancy sallied forth, sustained by clogs and a thick stick, to seek the assistance of a wise old shepherd, much respected in the neighbourhood. His cottage stood by itself at the further end of the village, and to reach it Nancy took a shortcut across the squire's park. She stumped along, well muffled in her warm shawl, every step leaving a deep print in the snow, hungry little rabbits or handsome melancholy pheasants occasionally crossing her path. Presently she started, for all at once a sort of faint cry fell on her ear. It was scarcely daylight yet, and with the exception of those already mentioned, there did not appear to be a creature stirring. She stood still and scanned the white waste of park, with its clumps of trees scattered here and there, and its boundary of gloomy firwood, not a human form in sight. Yet the cry which now broke the stillness again was distinctly a human cry. "'In God's name, whatever's that?' ejaculated Nancy. She strained her eyes once more, and became suddenly conscious of something unusual in the scene before them. "'Eh, hey, the great ash! The half of it's gone! There's never someone underneath!' The great ash, long so prominent a feature in the landscape, was riven in two, one huge branch having fallen in the night, and being partially covered with snow as it lay on the ground. Nancy dashed towards it, hearing as she approached a low moaning which warned her that her surmise was correct. Lo! Beneath the branch lay a figure half buried in snow, its mighty limbs crushed beneath the weight, its long fair beard entangled in the twigs. Martin! cried the girl, dropping on her knees beside him, and trying with all her strength to lift the heavy bough. But she could not move it one inch and her sturdy efforts added to his torture. "'Do not touch me,' he gasped. "'Do not. I, I'm all broke to pieces, and the snow's been falling on me the whole neat. I'm undie, I doubt.' "'Nay, you shanna cried Nancy bravely. "'Not while I'm alive to help you. Bide a bit and do not lose heart. I'll fetch a couple of chaps in a minute, as I'll be able to carry you.' She flew off to the village and presently returned with half a dozen stalwart labourers whom she had captured on their way to the field. They soon removed the branch and endeavoured with more good will than adroitness to set Martin on his legs, an attention which the hapless giant acknowledged by promptly fainting away. "'Eh, hey, you great fools!' shouted Nancy. "'His leg is broke most like. You mun not drag at him that gate. Get a shutter, one here, or an owd door and lay him on to shift him so. After a little delay, a door was procured. Nancy, meanwhile, covering the injured man with her shawl, and supporting his head on her knee. "'Where mun we take him to?' asked one of the bearers, as they prepared to start. "'We'll never be able to carry him so far as the lone end, where he lodges. He's mortal heavy, and looks as though he were going to dee. "'Take him to my place, then,' said Nancy. "'It's nearest, I reckon.' and I'll see as he's well done too. 
the doctor shook his head over martin he was nearly as he said himself broken to pieces one arm and one leg were fractured so badly that amputation was necessary several ribs were broken there seemed to be no end to the damage which the poor fellow had sustained nancy and old kitty her factotum nursed him with devotion if not precisely tenderness for many weeks miss pratt visited him once but her susceptibilities were apparently so much shocked by the sight of this wreck of a man that she did not repeat the attention rainford's parents were both dead and he had no near kin to fall back on therefore nancy's good offices were the more valuable as time passed and it was known for certain that martin would never be fit for work again much curiosity was aroused in the village as to what nancy's plans might be with regard to him did she mean to keep him always at the farm a poor doless creature as could scarce so much as dress himself and was it not rather a queer thing said some of the more severe for a wench same as her to make such a to-do with a chap like yon heads began to shake and tongues to wag over nancy's proceedings and one fine day her maternal aunt drove up in her chandry to remonstrate with her poor martin white-faced and melancholy with his clothes clinging loosely around his shrunken form his empty right sleeve pinned to his breast while a rug hid his solitary lower limb was installed on a couch by the kitchen fire therefore after exchanging a few commonplace remarks with him mrs wilcox conveyed to her niece by various telegraphic nods and winks her desire to speak to her privately they adjourned to the parlour and the elder woman proceeded to the point at once he do look bad for sure she remarked how is he going to get's living when he leaves this i don't know responded nancy composedly if he was to go to liverpool he might pick up a few pence sweeping across in happen suggested her relative cheerfully or maybe they'd take him in a show with all o one side gone i may say and him so big and tall they might do summat wi him i've seen sights as was less curious eh poor chap they say as when folks has their limbs chopped off they do not lose feeling in em for ever such a time did you see martin's arm when the doctor cut it off or his leg nay returned nancy quickly had summat better to do i reckon nor be gaping at such like i'd have liked to see em pursued her relative tranquilly lord o me i mind when owd jem said and had his fingers whipped off with a steam saw he picked em up with other hand and wrapped em in paper so nice and tidy and took em warm i met him i the road and i said eh hey, whatever's the matter jem you look all of a shake and for all he were feeling so bad he had to laugh what do you think as i've got here he says i can't tell i'm sure i says a handful of fingers says he and he opens out the parcel and shows me quite proud the poor chap eh hey, the whole village had to see jem's fingers and you never so much as axed to look at martin's arm well there'll be a to do wi him when he leaves this i reckon but it cannot be helped you'll have to get him out o' your road here soon anyway i can do with him said nancy folding her arms a trifle defiantly ay but there's a deal o' talk about him and you already returned mrs wilcox with a sudden change of tone people wonders at ye for keeping of him here him as is no kin to you nor nor your equals neither if you'd a been keeping company it ud a been different but him as was courting miss pratt yonder at the hall eh hey, if you'd a heerd all as folks are saying and it's none such nice hearing for your mother's sister neither i can tell you here mrs wilcox evinced a disposition to weep i dunnot care a brass farden for what folks say cried her niece snapping her finger and thumb not that i'm not going to turn the poor lad out o' the road for anybody tell polly birch she needn't think she'll see the straighter for making out as other people has crooked eyes i know what that long tongue o hers is at the bottom of any mischievous work as is a gate but i can let mine wag a bit too happen and then we'll see poor polly birch only spoke in kindness expostulated the matron i can do wi less kindness then are you going to the village now will you have a cup of tea first but mrs wilcox was too much hurt and offended 
to accept of any hospitality, and she drove off baffled and heated, leaving Nancy totally unconvinced. It was a different matter, however, when the canon spoke to her on the subject. Nancy had a great respect for the canon, and when she spied him walking up the little flag-paved garden path, her face beamed. He was smiling too at his own thoughts, but now he composed his features. I want a quiet word with you, Nancy. Do you, Canon? Yes, about Martin Rainford, you know. What are you going to do with him? There's not much as can be done with him, as I know, responded Nancy, her manner stiffening a little, and the smiles vanishing. Doctor says, as when he gets a bit stronger, he mun have a wooden leg. His ribs is mending, but his arms took right off up by shoulder. There's nowt as can be done for that. He'll never be fit for work again, I doubt. Well, but Nancy, he can't stay here, you know. He's no relation of yours, and you're too young to look after him as you do. People will talk. They're talking already. I care now to they are. Hard words break no bones, Canon. What's the poor chap to do? He mun have someone to do for him. He can scarce so much as feed himself, and he's no kin in the place. Well, he must go to the workhouse, I'm afraid. You can't keep him, Nancy. Come, be sensible. No young woman can take charge of a young man like that, unless, unless she's married to him. Eh, hey, Canon, cried Nancy indignantly. Married? Why, yon's but half a mom, poor fellow. Who'd wed wi' him? The Canon looked sharply at her. Who, indeed? Was there not something between him and one of the maids at the hall? Miss Pratt? contemptuously. I doubt she'll think no more of poor Martin now. She came here not but once to see him, howding up her skirts and cocking her nose in there when she passed the midden, and it made up with fine wholesome farmyard muck as it'd please anyone to sniff at. And when she saw Martin, she hollered out as if she were going to faint. Nay, I says, I canna do with faintings here, and our kitty smacked her hands till she come to pretty quick, but she never come since. We might get up a little subscription for him, said the canon meditatively. I'm sure the squire would help. Perhaps he need not go to the workhouse after all. He he might lodge somewhere. It mun be somewhere as he'll be well done to, then, put in Nancy. He wants looking at her, same as a babby almost. Who's going to be at the trouble of that? Well, well, we must see what can be done, but bear in mind what I tell you, Nancy. He must get out of this. I'm not going to have any more scandal-mongering about him. The canon nodded and went away, leaving Nancy in an unusually reflective mood. Miss Pratt had just finished dinner and was sitting in the housekeeper's room, toying with a strip of crotchet work and flirting with the footman, just to keep her hand in, when a message was brought to her that Miss Gilbertson wanted to see her. "'Won't you step in?' said Miss Pratt, tripping to the back door where Nancy stood her large back in its print bed-gown turned towards the house. "'No, thank you,' said Nancy, whisking round. She had been shaking her fist at the yard-dog, which was straining at its chain and barking itself hoarse, presumably tantalised at the sight of her sturdy, unprotected ankles. "'I want no but a word, will you?' "'Oh,' said Pratt, contemptuously surveying the stalwart figure in its unfashionable gear, and giving a little shake to her own smart silk dress, which was intended to provoke envy. Nancy snorted. She was not going to dress up for the likes of her, and knew that a single one of her fine pigs was worth more than the whole of Miss Pratt's wardrobe. But the action irritated her nevertheless. She looked defiantly at the sneering Abigail. "'It's just this. What are you going to do about Martin Rainford?' "'About him?' cried the other, starting and flushing. What about him? Ah, that's where it is. What about him? You have not troubled yourself so much about him, have you? He's doing pretty fair, doctor says, and he'll soon be fit for his wooden leg. But he'll never work no more. What's to be done with him? He's no kin to nobody here, eh? and he mun have someone to do for him. You and him had best wed as soon as you can, and then you can see to him proper. You'll not a save much of your wage, I doubt, with a scornful glance that took in Miss Pratt from her frizzled head to her high-heeled shoes. You'll not have a dale to start housekeeping on, 
but ye can take in washing and fat pigs and that miss pratt's face was a study ye'll not be the first woman as has had her husband to keep there was a dead silence presently the maid asked with a toss of her head if martin had sent nancy with this message nay i'm not going to run of errands for anybody i coom her mysel well what do you say the lad's got to be looked to and canon says as he munna stay longer wi me he's been well done to thee though i say it and if he mun go he mun ha somebody to take care of him well miss pratt well miss gilbertson i'm very sorry i'm sure that you can't keep martin any longer and i'm very sorry for him too poor fellow very very sorry but what can i do i i could not think of taking such a responsibility on myself i'm not equal to it and besides i don't think martin could expect any one to marry him now really the very idea is shocking besides for some time i've been doubting if i was suited to him and if i could make him happy i have other views at present i don't mind telling you miss gilbertson that i'm engaged to a very superior young man an english gentleman of irish extraction called murphy him and me and what's to become a martin put in nancy who apparently took no interest in miss pratt's plans except in so far as they regarded the ex-keeper really i can't be expected to know he must lodge somewhere i suppose canon says as he'll most likely have to go to the workhouse observed nancy stolidly well perhaps that would be the best thing for the poor fellow in the long run as he can't work returned miss pratt in a tone of relief they take very good care of people there i believe and we could go and see him and bring him tobacco you know poor martin loves his pipe with a sigh of sentimental reminiscence nancy raised her blue eyes which positively burned with scornful anger and moreover lifted her sturdy arm with so fierce a gesture that the little maid skipped hastily backwards for shame are ye cried nancy snapping her fingers close to the other's nose for shame are ye you dirty little slut thereupon miss pratt shut the door in her face and went into hysterics behind it and the mistress of brook farm trudged homewards she found that the dough for her weekly bread-making had run over the great brown pans and her anxiety to repair this mishap at first swallowed up all other thoughts presently however as she kneaded the solid mass punching it and rolling it in her usual vigorous style her eyes fell on martin installed as usual on the couch spelling over a week old newspaper the couch had been rolled to the open window partly to leave more room for nancy's bread-making operations and partly that the sweet april air might refresh the invalid an apple tree in blossom was waving its branches without in the breeze a row of hyacinths in glasses decorated the window-sill the birds were singing cheerily and the men were calling to each other in the adjacent field a great farm horse passed the window with clanking harness and slow ponderous tread followed by billy cracking his whip and whistling there was a pleasant stir and bustle the bustle of spring everywhere nancy sighed if it mun be done it mun be done she said to herself and then aloud did i tell you as canon's been here to-day nay said martin turning his head i wonder he didn't look in to ax how i were he's not been here this while back he were talking of you though said nancy plenty he thinks you ought to clear out of this soon he wants to know what you're going to do with yourself what i'm going to do repeated martin his face clouding over he may well ax there's nowt as i can do only ate other folk's stuff and lay here same as a log o' wood you'll be able to get about more when you've got your wooden leg but you mun have a woman to see to you and canon says it had ought to be your wife wife whatever's that you say who take up wi a broken down chap like me i went to miss pratt at thall said nancy and axed her straight if she were going to be as good as a word and get married to you and work for you same as you'd a done for her if you hadn't have had this accident and she said as she couldn't think of such a thing and was keeping company with some other chap now here nancy withdrew her arms from the dough folded them 
and looked with her sharp direct gaze at martin she had said her say part of it at least without wasting time in preliminaries and martin though he looked gloomy enough seemed by no means surprised ay he said after a pause i misdoubted me that she were up to summat of sort her and me had words the very neatest tree fell o me i misdoubted me then it were that i think as made me walk reet under that rotten owd ash tree with the wind blowing enough to deave one and the snow that thick as if i'd had me senses i'd have cut away warm instead of loitering in the park but i couldn't give over thinking of that wench and her ways i was fair moidered ah she's not one to moider herself with thinking of you then happen he'd best go to the workhouse she says did she say that asked martin quickly ay she did well happen it is the best thing i could do there was a moment's silence and then he struck the window-sill savagely with his solitary fist i wish yon tree had done a bit more damage while twas about it he said i wish it had cracked my crown the kindest service as any one could do me now had been to stick a cartridge in that owd gun of mine as i's never carry no more and put muzzle to my ear and blow my brains out i'm nowt but cumber nowt else and i'm no but twenty-six eh hey, lord it's an awful thing for the half of a body to dee afore t'other half it fair drives me mad to think on happen i'll live fifty year or more everybody wishing me dead and myself most of all nancy carefully wiped her floury hands in her apron stalked across the kitchen and possessed herself of martin's sturdy palm speak for yourself she said with a queer sort of laugh i do not wish you dead martin and i hope with all my heart as ye will live fifty year it needn't be in th workhouse when all's said and done ay but where mun i go canon says i mun be flitting from here nay he did not altogether say that he says nancy ye cannot do for yon chap same as you're doing now for ever ye're too young he should have a wife to look arter him well and then i went and axed miss pratt same as i told you ay and ye found as she cared nowt for me and for that matter i care nowt about her now well i'll tell ye plain martin as i always thought to do pretty well for mysel when i did wed i always said as i'd have no but a gradely chap for my master one as could work a bit for hisself and gaffer the men and that now you as you say i'll never be fit for much i this world unless happen said nancy with a provident eye to the future you could cut up a two three sea potatoes and feed the hens and such like ay said martin calmly i could do that belike and i could gaffer the lads too i can shout a bit still and my eyesight's as strong as ever it were ah but they'll never think so much of a master as has but one leg pursued nancy gazing at him with an appraising eye hey, and no but one arm and that the left it'll look rail bad when you're sitting at their table at harvest supper that you should have but the left arm to drink else with ah sighed poor rainford his face which had brightened up for a moment during the discussion darkening again it will that i doubt it's no use nancy my lass i'll never make a fit mate for you but i thank you truly all the same and take it very kind of you to ax me wait a bit i've more to say yet martin rainford the fust time i see you i says to mysel yon's the man for my money did you said martin with a sheepish smile ay he was a fine set-up fellow in those days well i'd a liked you then well enough and though i might say as the best party is gone i'm none of the kind that's always chopping and changing so if you're willing i'll make a shift to do with you as you are End of chapter 4「Chapter 5 of In a North Country Village」by M. E. Francis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Politics. Come in, ma'am, says Mrs. Wick. Come in and sit you down. It's a long time since you've come our way. Ah, the elections kept you busy. Indeed, they're enough to moider anybody. 
we hear too much of em here i can tell you especially since we've changed our politics didn't you know as we changed our politics here in the village ma'am eh dear yes and it's been a piece of business ever since what we one side and t'other when the elections comes round squire began it you know him and his family has always been liberals always used to be at least and of course we was liberals too well last election time not the last as ever was but the time before or was it the time before that again he went and turned round and said he was going to vote for the conservative party Eh yeah, well to think of it we all said and whatever could have come to the squire it seemed funny you know us women couldn't talk of nothing else and the men said that the notion seemed to stick in their throats maybe that was why they was always walking off to the public house to wash it down one man radical ted as we call him made a great to-do about it and said he wasn't going to turn his coat inside out not for nobody but none of us ever minded poor old ted squire called a meeting in the big barn up yonder and made a speech it was a beautiful speech ah indeed it was and he talked to us so nice about why he changed his views or rather says he it's the times that has changed the old liberalism is a thing of the past and the conservative party of the present day is the nearest thing to the liberal policy that you and me was brought up on says the squire and he said he was very much disappointed in the grand old man in fact says he leaning on his stick and looking round my opinion is that he's a grand old humbug and then he talked to us as friendly as possible about this kind of government and that kind of government there wasn't many of us as understood it all and he finished up by saying that the liberals were illiberal and the conservatives preservative eh you should have heard us cheering him my word you'd have thought the roof was coming off some of us fancied he was going into parliament himself but he says he was too old for that he was informed however that the gentleman who was going to stand for our division of the county was a very nice young gentleman indeed we'd have an opportunity of judging for ourselves soon he says because he was coming to hold a meeting here and he was sure we'd all attend and now he'd shown us why he had changed his opinions he hoped we'd all follow suit well we all cheered again and poor old joseph birch the carpenter sings out for he's a jolly good fellow as he always does whenever he gets a chance for he sets a deal of store by the squire a few days after a gentleman comes round the village a very nice gentleman he was first we thought it must be him as squire was talking of but he says no he was only a mutual friend and he sits down and he talks to us as natural as possible and praises squire till the tears comes into his eyes and he says we mustn't on no account vote for the liberals because if we do the agricultural interests of the country will be ruined and irishmen will be taking the bread out of the mouths of englishmen we all said that would be terrible and we'd try and attend the meetings and that but it was a busy season and we didn't know if we could so very well spare the time what says the gentleman quite astonished would you run the risk of ruining your country for the sake of an hour's work more or less get up a bit earlier in the morning he says turning pleasant again well then he gets out a card with two names on it one printed very big and that was his and squire's gentleman and the other very small now he says you can't make any mistake see this is the name you are to put your mark opposite to oh says we turning it about the big one we'll remember no 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 says the gentleman very flurried never mind whether it's big or little it's the name you've got to remember and he shouts it out a dozen times and spells it and makes us spell it till we're sick of the sound of it now you can't forget he says the very next day another of em comes and sits down and talks tells us what fine people we are and how honest and independent we've always been and now if we'll only vote right we'll enjoy greater prosperity than ever then he pulls out a card with one name printed very big and one name printed very little oh thank you says we 
the other gentleman left us one of those what other gentleman says he and he stops for a minute and then he says would you kindly let me have a look at it well when it's fetched he looks real put out why this is the wrong one he says you'll be getting muddled up if you keep this see this is the name of the people's friend the friend of the farmer and the labourer he says the friend of cheap bread and high wages and short hours he says and he shows us his card and the big name was a strange name and t'other the name of the squire's gentleman was wrote quite small and poor this is the name you've got to remember says he pinting to the strange one nay says we it was the t'other squire told us and are you going to be so poor spirited as to follow your squire's lead just like a flock of geese says he your squire indeed so he's been tampering with your liberties has he do you suppose he has your interests at heart or cares two pins for you except for what he can get out of you what can you expect from a man who has a wall round his place to shut out the people when the land should by right belong to the people and will do so yet if they have the courage to be true to themselves eh well says one of us we know the squire you see and we'd rather vote for a friend of his nor for a gentleman as we've never heard on and i doubt it's no worse for squire to have a wall to's place nor for me to have a hedge to my garden and you can leave your card if you like a side of t'other on the chimney-piece and so he did after a deal more talk and argument and there stood the cards side by side till one of the young ladies from the hall chanced to see them it's no use keeping two she said you'll only be making mistakes better put this one into the fire so into the fire she pops it and round she goes to every house in the place and does the same by every one of the cards as the last gentleman left my word there was a piece of work when some of his lady friends heard on it eh we was always having visitors that time we got to be quite moidered in the end not so much as saturday would go by but some one or other would walk in in the middle of our cleaning up the children half washed and all with how do you do and i hope we may count on you no says we don't count on us we've other things to be thinking on we were getting vexed at the end you see and then they said that they did like our fine independent spirit one of that lot took to sending soup to old granny gibson as if she hadn't sons and grandsons to work for her and keep her comfortable and granny says nothing not even thank ye so one day they axed her if she got it all right ah says granny i got it right enough gave it to the pigs i did says granny so after that they sent no more one day there was a deal of stir in the village some one had been talking about three acres and a cow as they heard was to be given to any one who was voted against squire's gentleman well you may think the cottagers had something to say about this none of their gardens run to more nor half an acre at most and as for cows it's only the gradely farmers as keeps them there was more talk about that nor anything else even old joseph the carpenter as never wants anything new and shakes his head at all these election doings even he said it would be very nice but squire come into his workshop so you ought to have three acres and a cow joe says he and he laughs fit to split and who is going to build your shippens i wonder i'm sure i shan't he says and then joseph unbethought himself as he always says and says he what's the good o going agin the squire i won't deny that three acres o land is nice and so's a cow very nice but who is this here chap as is going to give em to us and what do we know about him and the squire's been a good squire to us and a good friend to us and there what's the good o going agin him well joseph was right you see and there wasn't one here in the village as would say he wasn't for all the talk we heard about liberty and every man being as good as his better and that us and the squire was always friends we all know him and he knows us and his ways is ours after a bit the young gentleman as we'd all heard so much on him as squire was going to vote for you know come to hold a meeting here but he gave short notice and the very day of the meeting was dumbleton fair day 
the biggest fair in the country, as all farmers attend regular. There was messengers flying all over the place, telling everyone to come, and as many as could make time did come to the barn where the gentleman was to speak. A good few women was there, and almost all the big school children, but the men was most of them busy, and I doubt if there was more nor half a dozen of them there all told. But the barn was done up elegant with plants and flowers and decorations of all sorts, and when the young gentleman came out to speak, he looked round and smiled to himself. He began by saying how beautiful everything was done up, and how kind it was of the squire to have all so nicely prepared. And then he went on in a kind of sneery way to remark what a pity it was as the attendance didn't correspond with the decorations. The men sat there smiling, as if it was all as pleasant as could be, but I gave Mrs. Birch, as sat next to me, a nudge. What do you think of that, says I? Eh, yeah, says she, I don't make much count of young flippity gibbet. "'When's Squire going to speak?' "'Eh, but t'other talked our heads off afore he'd done, "'and when Squire clapped his hands, we clapped ours. "'But we was glad when he stopped.' "'Then the gentleman as came round with the card spoke, "'and another after that, "'and then at last Squire come to the front. "'Here, here!' cries Joseph, "'afore he'd said a word at all, "'and the rest of us hammered the floor with our umbrellas, "'and shuffled our feet and clapped our hands.' and Squire nods at us and laughs. His speech was the best. We always agreed on that pint. Afterwards, him and his young gentleman come round the village. He had a smile and a joke for everyone, had the young gentleman. Very pleasant he was. He says to Radical Teddy, You're bound to vote for me, you know. Why, you carry my colours in those blue eyes of yours. And what colour do I wear here? says Ted tapping his nose. I'm a red republican, says Ted. He gets them outlandish words out at newspapers, you know. Talking of colours, the day of the elections, them ladies, as I told you of, as sent Granny Gibson soup, waited for the children as they was coming out from school, and pinned bows a ribbon on em, boys and girls alike. Beautiful they was. But when our own young ladies, the ladies from the hall, saw them, they were, in a way, the idea, says they, of plastering our children with their disgusting radical ribbons, and they whipped them off before you could turn round, and popped on blue ones, and the children looked fine as they stood at the end of the village, cheering the voters when they passed. First, there was the squire driving his dog-cart, as pleased as Punch, with a blue bow in his buttonhole, and blue ribbons on the horse, and then come the farmer's shandries, and after them come wagons, as the farmers lent for the occasion, with all the cottagers, and off they drove, cheering all the way. And every man in the place voted for Squire's gentleman. Radical Ted come back so drunk that he couldn't tell as much about it, and he always said he couldn't remember which way he voted. But of course, we all knew without the telling that he'd never go for to vote again the Squire, and that's how we all changed our politics here in this village, ma'am. Now you have the whole story. End of chapter 5「Chapter 6 of In a North Country Village » by Emmy Francis This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Gillifers there is perhaps nothing of which the inhabitants of Thornley are more proud than the stocks which adorn their village green. Some time ago, the elders among them could even remember the days when poachers and tramps and drunkards used to be confined in them, and pelted by the youth of the neighbourhood with cabbages and rotten eggs. But it is long since the stocks, as an institution, were used in Thornley, and for years no one but old Jack Rutherford, Jilly for Jack as he was called, ever sat on the queer old bench which former generations had polished till it gleamed again. He found it a convenient resting place sometimes while he munched his bag in, for it was in the neighbourhood of his work, and moreover a sunny and cheerful spot. When Jack was not digging a grave for anybody, or ringing the church bell, or cutting wallflowers, he earned his living by mending the roads. That is to say, in summer he swept up the dust, and in winter he scooped the water out of the puddles with his shovel, and sometimes he found an old shoe or two, 
or a brimless hat which came in handy for filling up the ruts or if he chanced upon a very bad piece he scratched up a few stones out of a more level portion and laid them in the deepest holes the thornley people did not like paying rates and jack never had anything to mend the roads with therefore the local board thought he did very well as it was and so did jack himself and the squire who was chairman laughed when he found himself nearly bounced out of his dog-cart and said it was good for the liver to be jolted a bit jack's home was quite at the further end of the village a one-storied red cottage so old that the walls formed all kinds of curious curves and angles and every variety of moss and lichen appeared to flourish on the thatch the small paned windows were almost filled up with scarlet geraniums and the tiny garden without was bright with sweet williams and stocks and old-fashioned moss and cabbage roses the sweet cool delicious little monthly rose too bloomed gaily there nearly all the year round but the pride of jack's heart and the chief source of his income was the little field of wallflowers or as they are called in thornley gillifers which lay at the back of his house wallflowers of every shade from brightest yellow to deepest chocolate brown rows and rows of them poor old jack's back ached as he waded among them when they were in season his clasp knife crunching through their leafy stalks the basket on his arm growing fuller and heavier till at last it could hold no more and jack straightening himself and sighing would slouch over to marjorie turning out the sweet-smelling heap on the table where she sat bunching them for market they were sweet the scent of them used to hang over the entire village every one knew jack's gillifer field it was quite a feature in the place neighbours passing to and fro and farmers driving by would point out the gillifers to each other till at last the cottage itself and even the old couple to whom it belonged came to be known by that name marjorie indeed considered as an individual and not as her husband's better half could not have claimed any special title but collectively they were called the gillifers and Gillifer Jack was as well known in the neighbourhood of Thornley as the stocks themselves. Marjorie was the most motherly of wives, and was accustomed to devote much of her time and thoughts to the education of Jack, and certainly, as she said, emphatically many a time, if he did not know his duty, it would not be for want of hearing about it. As a rule, Jack obeyed her in all things, even to taking off his clogs before he crossed his own threshold and to wearing one of his wife's aprons on Sundays to preserve his best clothes. But unfortunately, in one or two points, he fell short of her ideal. There was his pipe, to begin with. In spite of everything Marjorie could say, he would persist in wearing his brass on backy, and many a sly whiff did he enjoy seated on a corner of the stocks, after a furtive glance round to make sure that his missus was not in sight. There were occasions, too, few and far between, for as a rule, Jack was as sober a man as a woman need be tied to, when he was known to be a little overtaken. At Christmas time perhaps a neighbour would treat him to a glass, which immediately affected his head, or rather his legs, and on club day, oh, club day was, as Marjorie said, a snare. Jack, of course, ribbon in coat and wand in hand, marched round the country with the other members of the Thornley and Little Upton Mutual Benefit Club. The band playing merrily, and the big banner with the squire's arms on one side, and a picture of the Good Samaritan on the other, streaming in the breeze. And of course, everybody had beer, and of course, poor Jack. Marjorie had bethought herself, and unbethought herself, often about this club. It was undoubtedly a good thing to belong to it, if jack was sick she could draw ten shillings a week from the club funds till he was able to resume work again and when he died the club would hand over quite a nice little sum towards his funeral on the other hand besides his subscription he was obliged to contribute like all the other members towards the annual dinner at the thornley arms and having paid for his share of the good cheer it was only fair that he should partake of it Marjorie's just and economical soul rebelled at the idea of sacrificing his rights, and yet it was always the same story. On this particular day every year, Jack forgot himself, and during the remaining 364, Marjorie reminded him of his slip. At last she made up her mind to take a decisive step, 
and renouncing with a struggle the value of that annual two and sixpence resolved to keep her husband at home in future when other folk went pleasuring accordingly when jack woke up one club day morning he found no shining suit of broadcloth laid out by his bed no wand no beribboned hat only his working clothes lying in a heap just as he had taken them off hullo he cried cheerfully what's gone wi your membry missus to-day's club day wheer's me sunday clothes i know what day it is well enough returned marjorie from the adjoining kitchen but you're going to none of their clubs to-day so you'll not need your good clothes get into t'others now and come to your breakfast it's late enough i'm not going to the club repeated jack in amazement and what am i not going to the club for me as has walked this thirty year what should ye not go for cried marjorie shrilly and then came a bang and clatter of crockery as she prepared for battle do you mean to tell me you forgot while she reminded him at length and in vigorous language of his misdemeanours of last year and the years preceding it jack hunted about for his clothes but the cupboard was locked and marjorie had the key in her pocket what was to be done was he to give up without a murmur the one pleasure of his life the outing to which for as long as he could remember he had looked forward from year's end to year's end be considered a backslider by his fellow members and become the laughing-stock of the countryside it was not to be borne just as marjorie was working up with great animation to this time five year ago the inner door was partially opened and jack's wrinkled face flaming with anger was thrust through the chink i mun my clothes woman hand over yon key and let's ha' no more to do i'll ha them or else go with the t'other ones i tell ye plain i'm goin so it bides wi you whether i'm to go decent or no john rutherford you're out o your senses i doubt exclaimed marjorie pretty doings indeed for you to be bargin at your wife that gate get on with them clothes and give over saucing me for shame of ye you don't go to your club to-day and ye needn't look for it your sunday suit shall bide i the cupboard and as for goin in th t'others i reckon ye know better nor make a sight o yourself at this time o day and are the children shoutin after ye in the lane jack banged the door to again and lost the remainder of his wife's speech he sat down on the side of the bed trembling with rage but for once in his life determined he was not going to be put off with marjorie's nonsense and would go to the club clothes or no clothes if it was only to shame her after a moment or two he rose and began to assume his ordinary gear with a solemn face and a sore heart things was come to a pretty pass indeed when he john rutherford the oldest member of the club was forced to attend the meeting in such togs as these he thought of how marjorie herself had hitherto always helped him to array himself with becoming splendour how she had brushed his coat and fastened his cravat and tied on his ribbons with wifely pride and care and now she served him like this he looked so subdued when he at length came into the kitchen that the woman's heart smote her in the midst of her elation at what she took to be her victory sit thee down she said gently pushing forward a chair nay i'll not sit me down marjorie rutherford said jillifer jack and i want none o your coffee i'm going to the club folks'll soon know the kind o wife i've got i'm going to shame ye for once that's what i'm going to do i'm going to shame ye he thrust his feet into the great clogs which lay in the chimney corner and shambled out of the house marjorie listening vaguely to the clump clump of his step till it was lost in the distance she was too much astonished at first to realise the full meaning of her husband's threat but after a time it dawned upon her that before nightfall the history of their quarrel would be known all over the place and that probably most of the neighbours would be weak-minded enough to take jack's part when her morning's work was over and she had cleaned her and donned a fresh apron she sallied forth to retail her wrongs to a few of her special cronies and was wounded with the coolness with which her explanations were received jack had evidently the public sympathy on his side indeed marjorie's conduct was looked on as a grave breach of village etiquette 
evening came and with it most of the merrymakers cheerful solemn or quarrelsome according to the amount of beer each had consumed during the day but no shabby figure in corduroys and clogs found its way to the gillifers and at last anxious and angry marjorie went out to look for her husband as she crossed the green behold there was jack outstretched beside the stocks with his head resting on the bench sound asleep so fast asleep indeed that he did not hear his wife shouting in his ear nor seemed disturbed when she shook and pummeled him finding all her efforts useless she drew herself up and looked at him with wrathful scorn if some folks could only see him now they would own that she had been right to try to keep him out of harm's way if she had a way every one in the village should come and see for themselves the kind of a husband she had laying there dead drunk against the stocks as in old days a man would be clapped into fast enough for misbehaving same as him it would serve him right to pop him in now give him a good lesson it would and let the neighbours know his goings on marjorie had a good mind she stopped suddenly and began pushing and hauling at jack's prostrate form she was a vigorous woman for a time of life and soon got him into the requisite position a momentary compunction struck her as she moved away after she had finished a task and she looked back several times the old figure looked so forlorn propped up against the bench the white head hanging forward the feet with their knitted socks of blue yarn and their huge clogs insecurely balanced on the toes protruding stiffly from either hole but she would not allow herself to be softened it was for his good after all and he deserved a lesson it was quite dark when jack came to himself feeling cold and stiff and ill at ease a lantern was flashing in his eyes and quite a number of faces were bending over him what's to do he murmured confusedly wherever have i got to he felt the grass beneath his hands and was astonished to find he could not move his legs i've had a stroke i doubt he said to himself his consciousness returning with a sudden keen throb of anguish and fear i mun a had a stroke he repeated aloud where's our marjorie wherever am i nay lad said some one ye haven't had no stroke you're i the stocks that's where ye are reet enough it's your missus as has served ye a bit of a trick chimed in another voice and then there came a laugh eh she's a gradely one is marjorie a gillifers she clapped ye into the stocks owd lad when ye was fuddled and left ye to your loan to get sober well twas a shame remarked another speaker if it hadn't a been for me i doubt she'd a left ye here for the neat i only wish i'd a lit on ye before and we should a gotten ye out a bit sooner they had released him by this time and helped him to rise poor old gillifer jack he felt as if he were the victim of a nightmare with the light flaring in his eyes the crowd of faces surrounding him one or two laughing the others wearing a look of pity quite as humiliating to the independent old fellow and what was it they were saying my missus put me of the stocks he muttered after a moment or two staring blankly from one to the other she put me of the stocks ah marjorie as has been wed to me this five and thirty year did ye say she put me of the stocks ah joe whiteside's tommy saw her didn't ye tommy he was frightened to tell us he says eh hey, but ye should have told us tommy why poor owd jack theer might have been dead afore morning jack pulled himself together with a sort of shiver and pushing through his friends set off walking hurriedly in the opposite direction to the village owd on owd chap yon's not the way home cried one of the men running after him i'm not going home said jack i'll niver go home no more ye can tell her so i'll niver set eyes on her again he would listen to no remonstrances and shaking off the hands which sought to detain him struck out again and presently disappeared into the darkness he walked on doggedly for hours though his limbs shook and his head felt dizzy and queer and was thoroughly exhausted when at last in the cold grey dawn 
he made out the undefined shape of a shed in a field near the road. "'I mun lay me down a bit,' he said to himself, "'or else I'll drop down. Eh, hey, to think I should come to this, "'sleeping i' the field same as a tramp.' He thought of the warm feather bed at home, and the pile of blankets, and the flannel-lined patchwork quilt. Marjorie, no doubt, was tucked up quite comfortably, while he was outside in the cold dew. Perhaps she thought he was still in the stocks. Very like she did, he mused, and a big sob rose up in his throat. Oh, that she should have served him so! Marjorie, his missus! There was not much sleep for Jack, but he dozed a little from time to time, and rose up at last, aching in every limb. After pursuing his march for some hours, he found himself in a big manufacturing town, through the streets of which he shuffled, jostled at every step by the passers-by, and feeling puzzled and not a little alarmed. It was lucky for him that with all his timidity and simplicity he retained a certain amount of shrewdness, and did not manage his affairs so badly as might have been expected on the whole. He engaged a room in a quiet back street, and after knocking about for a day or two, till his little stock of money got low, was fortunate enough to obtain employment, not very remunerative employment, but still sufficient to pay for his food and lodging, and to keep him supplied with shag. He was so quiet and good-natured, so regular in his goings and comings, and so easily pleased, that the good people of the house grew quite fond of him. He had his own place in a corner by the fire in the little parlour behind the shop, and here of an evening he would smoke a pipe with the master of the house, while the missus retired upstairs to put the children to bed. It was long before Jack could get out of the way of hastily pocketing his pipe and assuming an air of elaborate unconsciousness when the good woman reappeared. It seemed such a strange thing that she did not sauce him for smoking. But indeed, so many things were strange to Jack nowadays that he lived in a state of bewilderment. That no one should barge at him for making a clatter with his clogs, or for getting his clothes dirty, or for spilling his tea, that his pipe should be tolerated, and that he should be actually invited to partake of an occasional mild brew of whisky and water, were perpetual marvels to him. The presence of the children, too, of which there were half a dozen or so generally tumbling about on the floor, help further to astonish and puzzle his poor old brain. Yet oddly enough, it was when they had retired for the night, and Jack and his host sat tranquilly smoking, that our friend felt least at ease. He would stare at the stolid face opposite to him, as if wondering how it came to be there, and then take his pipe from between his lips, and glance round the room with a sigh. Eh, hey, he would say to himself, it's quiet here, eh. Hey. It's, it's awful quiet. Then he would think of the little kitchen at home, and of Marjorie's active figure bustling about, and of a sharp voice. It was more natural-like, all the same, and a man didn't feel so strange and lonesome. If only his missus hadn't served him such a trick. No man would stand that, and Jack's meditations generally ended in a glow of anger and resentment. The months wore away, Christmas had come and gone, and spring had arrived, and one day it chanced that Jack, on returning from work, met a girl in the street selling wallflowers. The sight of the great basket, full of brown and yellow and amber blossoms, the familiar scent, the touch of the velvety bunches as she brushed past, were too much for him. He leaned for a moment against a lamp-post, trembling. "'Fine wallflowers! Penny a bunch!' shouted the girl, paying little heed to this tall grey old labourer. She was now out of sight, and Jack, heaving a deep sigh, walked slowly homewards. So, they were in season again. He wondered how the missus was getting on. She'd never be able to cut them, not she. And if she hired a man to do it, what would become of her profit? She'd have to get someone all the same. And Jack did not half like the idea of any outsider hacking at his wallflowers. They'd spoil the plants among them, most like. He himself had always been so careful never to break or injure them, to avoid bruising the roots, to economise the buds. 
all that evening he thought of his field of gilly flowers and of the old life and of marjorie he felt a certain pity for marjorie she'd never make nothing out of them that she wouldn't happen by this time she was sorry enough for having druv her husband away from her she'd never make no hand of they gilly flowers it had really be almost worth a man's while to step up thornley way and see how she was getting on that night he dreamt of his gillifers and next day as he went to his work he still thought of them and fancied he smelt them and sometimes he even stretched out his hand as though to take hold of them and at last the gillifers drew him countrywards and he found himself walking rapidly in the direction of his home his face wore a very sheepish expression as he approached thornley the neighbours would laugh at him he reckoned and marjorie how would she receive him he'd not quite made up his mind as to what he should say to marjorie but he knew that he was very tired of being away from home he approached his house by a circuitous route not wishing to meet any of his former friends and being most anxious to avoid the neighbourhood of the stocks he insensibly quickened his pace when the familiar odour of the wallflowers first greeted his nostrils and his heart was thumping and his eyes full of tears as he passed through the little gate and in at his door a woman was standing in the kitchen superintending something in a small saucepan on the fire not marjorie as the first glance told him at the second he recognised with some alarm the portly figure red face and squinting eyes of a very different person mrs nancy frith who was charwoman washerwoman manager of the shop on ordinary occasions but whose real vocation lay in what she termed nussin from the administration of cinder tea to a baby to the adroit chucking away of a feather pillow from under the head of a dying man to hasten his departure when his agony appeared unduly prolonged there was no branch of her craft in which she was not an adept most of the infants of the village had begun life and all the moribunds had become corpses under her superintendence occasionally indeed the former had been unhandsome enough to upset her calculations and defraud her of a lawful dues but the latter rarely disappointed her from the moment when fixing her swivel eye upon their blanching countenances she had first informed them they were sadly warsening to that in which when the patients were tall and the stairs narrow she had cheerfully recommended their removal to a room on the ground floor it being a deal of trouble to get a coffin out at winder they had ever justified her confidence and submitted to her decrees jack's heart sank as he saw her and pausing abruptly he thrust forward his shaggy head and inquired tremulously if the missus were ill god bless us ejaculated mrs frith it's never you jack rutherford well it's time you come back to look out your poor wife as has been deein all the winter you're no but just in time too for she's sinkin fast and the way she've took on about you it ud melt a stone it would only a two three minutes ago she says to me when she was choosing the sheet out to wind her in here yeah, she says to think as it won't be me as'll have the layin out o my poor owd man i've allus said as one o them sheets theer ud be for him and for t'other for me she says an to think as it's me as has to go first and niver knowin wheer he is nor what's come to him and happen she says it'll be the parish as'll lay him in his coffin wi nobbut some cotton rag or other to lap him in eh she did take on jack's jaw had dropped and his face had turned an ashy grey colour she's she's deein he asked in an awe-stricken whisper and what else could ye expect responded nancy fixing him with one eye while the other gazed steadily out of the window you goin off and leavin her to fend for herself and she a lone woman and gettin on in years and frettin eh she did fret she never looked up arter ye left and comin on christmas she took to her bed and theer she's been mostly ever since ah ye'd best go into her ye'll not have her so long jack staggered across the kitchen and opened the inner door closing it after him and standing for a moment without speaking just within the room where his wife lay she was very still and her face looked strangely drawn and white as it rested on the pillow she turned her head as he entered and gazed at him fixedly 
Jack gave a queer little one-sided nod and cleared his throat. Well, missus, he said. Jack, she exclaimed with a faint cry. I thought I was dreaming. It's never our Jack. Aye, said he, approaching hastily. I'm, I'm, and then he broke off and sat down suddenly on the bed. Eh, missus, he murmured under his breath. Eh, poor owd lass. Two great tears leaped out on his wrinkled cheeks, but Marjorie stretched out a feeble hand and laughed a thin quavering laugh. So you're back, she said. I'm pleased to see ye. Eh, I'm pleased. Eh, I am pleased. And yet I doubt we will not be so long together. Doctor says I'm going a long road, Jack. Jack looked at her, and the big babyish tears rolled slowly down his cheeks and fell with a splash on Marjorie's hand. I'll be a deal comfortabler now ye here come, went on the latter feebly. Ye'll see to things, won't ye? And there'll be no need to have Nancy fidgeting about and waiting for the breath to go out of my body. Ye can get her to come to lay me out, you know. I were talking to her about it, and settling about coughing and that. Ye might as well get Billy Rufford to make it. Me and his mother was awful thick while she lived, poor soul. He'd do it as well as any one, I reckon. Ah, happen he would, agreed Jack dolefully, but interested too. Have no such liking for plain deal. It's awful common, resumed Marjorie. But I should like pitch pine. Eh, have an awful fancy for pitch pine. Do you think Billy'd make it out of pitch pine, Jack? I'll see as he does, quavered Jack, wiping his eyes with his coat cuff. Thank ye, said his wife meekly. Eh, I'm glad ye back, Jack. I'm glad to see ye, and I'll be sorry to leave ye. Ye was allus a good man to me, Jack. She awful bad, said the poor old fellow to himself, overwhelmed at this new tone. Doctor's reet. She's going. She don't speak, nor yet look like our Marjorie. She mun be going fast. But he said nothing aloud, only sat there staring at her with woe-begone eyes and holding her thin hand in his. Presently Nancy Frith appeared, carrying the posset which she had been concocting in the kitchen, and immediately flew at Jack for sitting on the bed. Just look at the way you've messed all the sheets with your dusty clothes, and feather bed all pushed to one side, and your wife almost smothered. You munna sit there. Nay, he can bide, interrupted Marjorie fretfully. I can do with him. He's no need to move. Jack shook his head afresh over this unusual tolerance, and Nancy fairly gasped. A further surprise awaited her, however, when Marjorie informed her peremptorily that she had no further need of her services, as her husband would do for her in future. He'll let you know when I'm gone, she added tranquilly, and you can look in and do all as is wanted then. Mrs. Frith did not at all approve of this arrangement, but had no choice but to comply, and accordingly took herself off in some dudgeon. Then Marjorie heaved a sigh of deep satisfaction. Ye can see to me, can't ye? she said. Eh, but it's a comfort to have your own folks about ye again. I'll see to ye, said Jack, and then silence fell between the two. The old woman dozed a little, and her husband sat on the bed and looked at her, ejaculating, Eh, missus, occasionally, in a dolorous whisper, it was quite dark when Marjorie spoke again, so suddenly as to startle him. I doubt I shouldn't have put ye in the stocks, she observed. I reckon ye did it for my good, returned Jack huskily. Ah, assented Marjorie, I meant it for your good, and I never meant to leave ye there for the neat. What happen I didn't ought to done it? I'm glad as I can tell ye so. I've bethought myself many a time as happen I were a bit hard on you sometimes, and you were awful patient. Nay, nee, growled Jack through the darkness. There was never no call for patience. I didn't ax no better, missus, nor what you've allus been. 
I were reet enough. Have I to fetch a candle now? He stumbled out of the room and gave vent to his feelings in the kitchen, sobbing and rubbing his eyes as if he were seven years old instead of seventy. For the next two or three days he scarcely stirred from his wife's bedside, and his ministrations, clumsy and awkward as they were, seemed to be acceptable to the invalid. She quite revived as she directed and admonished him, and now and then there crept a shade of sharpness into her voice, which filled Jack's heart with rapture. The mere fact of having someone to look after and keep in order seemed to give her a stronger grasp of life. And as the days passed, and the doctor saw that she was still holding out, he began to think there might be a chance for the old woman, one day, when Jack was seating himself by the bedside, according to his custom, after having tidied the room and given Marjorie her breakfast, she pulled back the check curtain at the head of the bed and looked at him sharply. "'Isn't gillyflowers a blow now?' "'Ah,' said Jack, "'a deal of them.' "'Well, just you go out and cut them, then. We can't afford to let them go to waste. I wonder at ye. That I do. And doctor to pay.' and so much money going out. I were loath to leave ye, pleaded Jack. Well, I can do without ye well enough, responded his wife tartly. Jack went to work without more ado, but being uneasy in his mind, returned so often to inquire how Marjorie found herself now, and if she was pretty comfortable, that after the tenth visit or so she lost patience. Be off wi ye, she cried, and don't come moidering me again. I'd rather have your room nor your company, ye owd dundead. Jack closed the door and went out again, chuckling and rubbing his hands. Owd dundead, he repeated. That sounds more like our Marjorie. Same as owd times, that is. I reckon she'll do now. He whistled as he stooped over his gillifers, and often paused to laugh to himself and nod in the direction of the house, winking and looking very knowing. Ow oh, dunderhead, he would mutter from time to time, in high glee. Ah, I reckon she's turned corner. His prophecy was realised, and in less than a week the doctor was amazed on looking in to find his patient sitting up in the bed, bunching gillifers, and rating her husband soundly. End of chapter 6「Chapter 7 of In a North Country Village by M. E. Francis」This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Aunt Jinny All Thornley was much excited when Mrs. Martha Billington came to live there. Her husband had been a native of the place, and was reported to have left her a nice little bit of money, and when she took up her abode at the quarry cottage opposite Rutherford's, the whole neighbourhood dropped in to make her acquaintance, and to condole with her, and to be regaled with the harrowing account of her gaffer's last end. He had been a tailor by trade, and things had prospered fairly with him, and would have prospered more, had not the sprees in which he occasionally indulged caused him to neglect his business for weeks together. One of these sprees had terminated fatally. He had left his home and had not returned. Mrs. Billington loved to describe her uneasiness, her inquiries, her anxious search, and the anguish with which she had at last identified a body washed up on the shore yonder as that of her lost Richard. It was true that he was that far gone that most people would have found it difficult to recognise him. Martha laid stress on this point, but she had at once identified his hair and his waistcoat, and the shoemaker last employed by him swore to the patches on his boots and so she was enabled to draw his insurance money and give him a handsome funeral. The Rutherfords were, as has been said, her nearest neighbours, and curiously enough Joe Rutherford was a widower. He was a big, shambling, thick-headed, soft-hearted fellow, with a rooker little childer, whom he would have been altogether at a loss how to bring up, had it not been for his Aunt Jinny. On the death of his wife three years before, he had asked Aunt Jinny to keep house for him, and she had given up her work, and said good-bye to the cousin with whom she lodged, and carried her bits of things triumphantly down the lane to Joe's. 
the neighbours laughed a good deal and wondered what hand an old maid same as her would make of all they little uns and how long it'd be before the baby followed its mother but jinny had no misgivings she sat down at once beside the cradle and smiled her toothless smile at the sleeping infant and informed the other children in a whisper that if they were careful not to disturb it she would make a potato cake for tea thus was aunt jinny's reign inaugurated and a happy and prosperous one it proved to be joe and the children were better done for indeed the house cleaner and the garden more orderly than in the time of the late mrs rutherford upon whom thornleigh had been wont to look down as a sickly poor crater at the best of times jinny was never happier than in the little patch of garden and her roses and nasturtiums and sweet peas were the admiration of the countryside a lilac bush stood on one side of the little gate and a red thorn tree on the other which made a brave show in spring it was a pretty little place altogether this tiny flag-roofed red cottage perched on the very edge of the delf where gorse bloomed gaily in the clefts and tall reeds and yellow irises grew in the water at the bottom but eh it was very small martha billington said and she wondered how jinny was not moidered to death with all those children messing about in such a bit of a place but she constantly made her way there all the same being a lone woman it was natural that she should call upon joe to help her whenever she wanted firewood chopped or a shelf knocked up or a door handle screwed on and being a matron of long standing who had buried three of her own it was equally natural that she should bestow a great deal of advice on old maid jinny who couldn't as she frequently observed be expected to know much about the bringing up sir childer jinny didn't as a rule make much count of what mrs billington said though she was a little nettled when told that the baby was but a wummicky thing and that teddy would certainly get nesh in his innards if she didn't give over stuffing him with treacle butties she was seriously annoyed however when joe took to quoting mrs billington and to stating with unnecessary emphasis that she really was a stirring woman now and to looking in on the widow almost every evening to see if she wanted any odd jobs doing no one was surprised when the bands were given out between joseph rutherford and martha billington and jinny put the best face she could on the matter though she couldn't help taking it rather hard a joe and wondering whatever he could be thinking of to marry a woman ten year older than himself she occasionally said fifteen but that was in moments of extreme exasperation and what will ye do now jinny asked one of the neighbours commiseratingly on the eve of the wedding do said jinny why much the same as i've allus done i suppose and how will the new missus like that inquired the neighbour you'd happen better follow mary to upton i reckon things'll not be so comfortable for ye here mary was the cousin with whom jinny had formerly lived she was a dressmaker by trade and had recently left the village and set up with a widowed sister at upton aunt jinny's face fell and she began to rub her shrivelled hands together mary couldn't do wi me now she returned my sight's too bad for the sewing and lisa and me never did get on so well and it'd seem strange to leave thornley now the children had happened fret poor things they're used to me you see and i couldn't find it in me heart to leave them eh hey, i'll be reet enough joe'd never get on without me now and mrs joe'll happen find me useful i doubt for all she's so stirring she isn't such a terrible one for work as joe thinks and she won't care to be troubled with childer so jinny with the best grace she could muster gave up her place at the head of the table and the new mrs rutherford took possession of the teapot and carved the sunday beef though she was kind enough to allow her husband's aunt to cook it and moreover to do most of the scrubbing and cleaning and to undertake the family wash as for the children it was astonishing with what confidence she abandoned them to the care of the old maid though she took advantage of her authority as stepmother to forbid treacle butties and potato cakes had become things of the past but she certainly did her duty by them in the matter of cuffs and scoldings and the little rutherfords spent in consequence much of their time out of doors joe too who appeared a little startled and uncomfortable at this new state of things went much oftener to the upton arms than in former days and jinny grew silent and depressed there was not much love lost between her and mrs joe and though she saved her niece-in-law much trouble the latter secretly longed to get her out at the road 
Ginny, however, evinced no signs of wishing to depart, and Joe stoutly and indignantly resisted any of his wife's hints as to the desirability of inviting her to take up her abode elsewhere. So things went on uncomfortably, and when the winter came, Ginny was short-sighted enough to complicate matters by a sharp attack of rheumatic gout. Certainly, Mrs. Joe couldn't be expected to attend to her. Ginny herself saw that, and as the children were so young, and Joe at work all day, and as nobody had money to be throwing away on hired attendants, there was obviously nothing for it but for Aunt Ginny to go to hospital in town. So poor Ginny, a mere bag of aching bones, was put into a cab and drove off with Mrs. Joe beside her, and cried piteously under her wraps all the way. Mrs. Joe left her at the hospital and returned every week to see her, a sign of feeling which touched Ginny and cheered her with the hope of better times in future. She grew better at last, though she was wretchedly weak, and it was doubtful if those poor distorted hands of hers would ever be fit for work again. Still, she was practically well, and one day triumphantly informed her niece-in-law that she was to be discharged the following week. "'The children'll be glad to see me, won't they?' she chuckled, and then Mrs. Joe told her that Joe and she had been thinking, and really it was very unfortunate, but they didn't see how they were to manage about her now. Ginny sat up and gasped. Joe thinks, you know, pursued her niece, as it can't be expected as he can do with a sick body in th' house. Times is bad, and the children has but him to look to. There's the expense to be thought of, you know, and who's to do for you? Eh, hey, I'd not want no doing for, pleaded Ginny, big drop suddenly standing on her brow. I, I, I could soon manage little jobs about the house, same as I used, you know. And my mate's not much, she added wistfully. I allus was a poor eater but Martha was firm. Anyone could see for their cells as Ginny had never do a hand's turn again. Besides, Joe had said plain as he couldn't keep her, and what was a body to do? The man was gaffer in his own house. Joe said he couldn't keep me, repeated poor Aunt Ginny. Eh, hey, well, happen he's reet. But what mun I do? Where mun I go? Eh, hey, there's lots of places for poor folk now, where they're as comfortable as can be returned Mrs. Joe. Things isn't as they used to be, you know. Why, yonder there, at the north side of town, the old folks has parties and tea drinkings and a lovely yard to walk in. Do you mean at the Union? interrupted Ginny, clasping her poor twisted hands appealingly. Eh, hey, Martha, will Joe let me go there? Martha, Martha, will I go there? Eh, hey, Martha, let me dee at home. I'll soon dee. I'll never ax for nowt, but don't say I have to go yonder. But of course she did have to go yonder. There was nothing else for it. And as for returning to Thornley for a week or two first, as poor Ginny desperately suggested, who was going to be at the expense of shifting her backwards and forwards? Martha wanted to know. Ginny was too weak and too old and too ill to withstand her and a few days later found her at that Gehenna of the respectable poor, the workhouse. Everything was very neat and clean and orderly. Her food was plentiful and good of its kind, and Ginny was still feeble enough to be sent at once to the infirmary, where she found her bed fairly comfortable, and her neighbours on either side quiet and well-spoken. But as she lay there staring blankly at the whitewashed wall opposite, or drew her head under the clothes to weep at her ease. She said to herself that it was a dreadful place, and wished with all the ardour of her poor old heart that she could die. But she didn't die. She got better instead, and by and by the little dainties which had been considered necessary for her were cut off, and soon she was allowed to get up and sit beside her bed instead of lying in it. After Christmas, they said, she would be well enough to leave the infirmary and go into the house. Ginny listened blankly. After Christmas, what did anything matter? She was to spend her Christmas in the Union, and that was enough for her. Some of the other paupers, old stagers, contented with their lot, talked gleefully of the fine doings she might expect at Christmas. They always had a party, they said, and the ladies came and played and sang for them, and there was a Christmas tree. And then Ginny thought of how she used to put toys and sweeties at the foot of the children's beds at home, 
and turned her face to the wall. Ladies visited the ward sometimes, chatting to the patients and cheering them with little presents of tea and snuff and lozenges. And one day a young girl came in and sang for them. Aunt Jinny sat very still listening, her hands folded in her lap, her dim eyes gazing at the glaring white wall. Ay, and beyond the squalid streets and the miles of stony road at Thornley and her youth and green fields and friendly faces. The young voice paused and then rang out afresh, and all at once Jinny became old and miserable again. It was the Christmas hymn which resounded through the room now. The Christmas hymn, and there she was in the workhouse. Rising, she uttered a hoarse cry, and stretching out her lean arms, fell sideways on her bed, her whole form writhing convulsively. The singing ceased abruptly. The nurse hurried down the ward. The patients craned their neck to see what was the matter with the woman. Was she in a fit? But Jinny was only sobbing. Then the singer came to her and took her hand and spoke kind words to her, and Jinny grew calmer and presently explained that the Christmas hymn had upset her terrible and that she couldn't, couldn't, not if it was ever so, make up her mind to the thought of spending Christmas at the Union. If it weren't for the thought of Christmas, I think I could welly resign myself, said Jinny, looking up, while big tears coursed down her wrinkled nose. I welly think I could, but eh, to be here at Christmas. I can't say the will of the Lord be done. And if you could go away for Christmas, do you really think you would mind being here less afterwards? asked the young lady. That I would, returned Jinny with conviction. I could bear myself better. You know, miss, I can't tell you how tis, but it seems as if I couldn't niver hold up my head again after spending Christmas at the workhouse. The girl was young, and perhaps not very wise, but her heart was soft and her purse was full, and so, when no one was looking, she slipped a half-sovereign into Jinny's hand. "'Now you can go away for Christmas,' she said. Who could describe Aunt Jinny's joy and the feelings with which, on Christmas Eve, she found herself hobbling along the road to Thornley? It was only two miles from Upton Station, and Jinny had preferred to walk and to spend the few shillings which remained to her after paying the railway fare and her cab across town in presents for the children. There were oranges and sugar sticks in her bundle, and a doll for Polly, and a trumpet for Teddy. She had even managed to buy a necktie for Joe Rutherford, and a bright-coloured handkerchief for Martha. Thus laden, she thought she could not fail to be welcome. She had winked to herself, indeed, and rejoiced in her own cunning, when she had chosen the handkerchief. Martha would certainly be civil after such a present as that, and as for the others, bless their hearts, she knew they would be glad to see her. It was true that she had wondered and fretted a good deal yonder, because Joe never came to see her, but now she told herself that it wasn't to be expected. He would be glad to see her now, this was more to the point. She pictured the slow smile which would creep over his face. He would surely cry out, Why, it's never Aunt Jinny, and then the children would dance round her and clap their hands. How surprised they would all be! Jinny chuckled to herself as she thought of it. That was almost the best part of it. They would all be at tea most likely when she got there, and she would tap at the door and say, A Merry Christmas to you! And then, what a pushing back of chairs, what a fuss and scampering there would be. Martha might look a bit sour at first, very likely she would, but Jinny would make haste to present her handkerchief and would whisper in her ear, I've not come for long, and so she would begin to be pleasant. Perhaps Joe might say as he didn't see why Jinny need go back to the Union. She wasn't not to say sickly now. But there, it was best not to think of that. She would stay over the new year at any rate. It was difficult to walk along the road very fast, for the trodden snow was slippery, and Jinny's limbs were stiff and feeble and the oranges would keep slipping out of her bundle and rolling just out of arm's length. It would soon be dark, and still she had a good way to go, but she thought of the bright lights in Thornley yonder, and the warm fire and the children's happy faces, and trotted on, still smiling to herself. She had just picked up an orange for the seventh time, 
and re-knotted her bundle and straightened her back when a portly figure suddenly rounded the corner of the road and paused staring back at the sight of her why martha cried jinny colouring faintly and stretching out her hand aunt jinny it's niver you ejaculated mrs rutherford whatever brings ye here and where on earth are ye goin i were goin home quavered jinny making great haste to fumble in her pocket for martha's handkerchief i'm not comed for long just for christmas martha i couldn't stop in the union at christmas time you know a lady gave me ten shillings for me ticket and that and i've some little presents here she shook out the handkerchief and diffidently proffered it to martha i, I thought happen you might find this come in for yourself she added tremulously martha took it and turned it over and then tendered it back to her with an odd look on her face you'd best keep it she said gruffly it'll keep your neck warm i've just got me one as is twice as big and i've no need for two jinny took it desperately wounded and blinking hard to keep back the tears martha stood still in front of her her stout figure completely blocking up the path something in her very attitude as well as the expression of her stolid face making the poor old woman's heart turn sick within her with a new awful fear I i'll not stop long martha she whimpered ye'll not stop at all returned mrs rutherford ye munna think o going to our place we couldn't do with ye why woman what should ye come to shame joan the childer for them as ye think so much of what would all the neighbours say if they knowed their aunt was of the union and where do they think i've been all this time asked jinny her tears suddenly ceasing though she trembled like an aspen leaf e your grave said martha setting her arms akimbo and looking fiercely defiant i towed em ye was dead there and i towed joe ye was dead and the childer and joe's been wearing a black band on sat for ye all the winter and he'd be fit to kill me if he knowed so i'm not going to let ye come to thornley to make mischief between man and wife there jinny's brain reeled and she sank down a very heap of misery on the snowy roadside feebly trying to push her niece from her as she bent over her i'll not leave ye till i see ye on your way back to town said martha ark now jinny rutherford it'll be the worst day's work ye did o' your life if ye come between joe and me and what's more he'd never hold up his head again if it was said as ye came straight to his house for the union dear now it'll be no kindness to him if ye do i tell ye very well then moaned poor jinny ye needn't trouble yourself martha i'll not go nigh him she struggled to her feet with the aid of mrs rutherford and held out her little bundle these here bits of things i'd like the childer to have em the dolls for polly and the trumpets for teddy and and there's marbles for the other lads and a few sugar sticks and things ye might tell em as with a great gulp as feyther christmas sent em and there's a necktie here as i got for joe will ye give it him martha promised looking rather sheepish as she took possession of poor jinny's little gifts there still remained the handkerchief which jinny after contemplating it for a moment and observing with great dignity that she wouldn't trouble martha with that flung over the hedge then she wrapped her shawl more closely about her and turned round good afternoon she said hobbling off slowly in the direction when she had come martha watched her for a few minutes and finding she did not pause or turn her head heaved a deep sigh of relief and betook herself homewards jinny walked on sobbing as she went and occasionally lurching against the hedge in her weakness and despair it was growing dark now and her sight was blurred with tears so she made many false steps and at last stood stock still feeling she had neither strength nor spirit to advance further why need she hurry after all what great speed was required for a journey which was to end in the workhouse oh the cruelty of it the injustice to force her to go there and then to be ashamed of her and martha had told every one she was dead joe had been wearing a black hat band for her such poor vitality as jinny possessed tingled within her with indignation she felt outraged and humiliated 
how was it that if joe had thought her dead he had made no effort to go to her funeral martha had probably put him off in some way but all the same jinny felt this slight to her imaginary corpse acutely where did they suppose she was buried and how was it possible folks thought she'd been buried by the parish the blood swept over her face at the idea it was the crowning ignominy the bitterest drop in all her cup of gall and yet this was what she must surely come to she would never leave that living tomb to which she was about to return until she was carried out for her pauper funeral yonder stood thornley church dimly defined against the murky sky yonder lay her father and mother and all her people and she was to go back to die in the union to be buried by the parish she started forward clenching her hands that i won't she cried and she began feebly to drag herself towards thornley a certain desperate determination shaping itself in her mind the while she had promised not to go back there to live but she would go back there to die she would creep under cover of the darkness to rutherford's corner of the churchyard and there she would lay her down she had heard that people who laid them down in the snow slept never to wake again well it was better than going back to die in the union and when the people found her in the morning lying with her own folks they would see that she had not been buried by the parish and joe she knew would make sure that she was carried to her long home decent it seemed a long journey and it was certainly a painful one but jinny reached her goal at last and sank down on her mother's grave she had a right to be there at least no one could turn her away this was her place with the dead oh the snow was cold and jinny was numb and weary but she summoned up all her courage and composed her weary limbs and folded her arms on her breast she would say her prayers now here i lay me down to sleep she began using the little formula which she had repeated every night since that far away childhood of hers but the words would not come right and she could not rouse herself sufficiently to recall them here i lay me here i lay me down to sleep she repeated aloud drowsily and then she began to see bright colours and to feel very comfortable so comfortable that she was not a little indignant presently when she became aware that somebody was shouting in her ear and endeavouring to raise her after a long blank interval she found herself to her immense astonishment seated before a blazing fire in the canon's kitchen the canon's housekeeper was chafing her feet the canon himself rubbing her hands while opposite to her with open mouth and eyes goggling almost out of his head was her nephew joe rutherford himself joe she ejaculated faintly it is her said joe clapping his hands ecstatically it's herself it's aunt jinny how she comes here beats me but here she is and that's enough how are you aunt jinny eh i'm fain to see ye but my head's that fuzzy i welly he think i mun be dreaming the honest fellow who had been half laughing and half whimpering during this speech here made a clutch at jinny's hand pumped it vigorously up and down and burst out crying but when jinny presently told her story feebly and by slow degrees his countenance changed and when the canon seeing that his indignation excited and further exhausted the old woman sent him out of the room he went straight home and thumped martha his feelings imperatively demanded an outlet of some kind and this appeared to him equally suitable and satisfactory wife beating was practically unknown at thornley but on this occasion joe certainly did correct his spouse in the manner above mentioned and it must be owned that she deserved it jinny lay between life and death for several days the strain and shock and subsequent chill proving almost too much for her the canon had duly lectured her for having courted death as she had done but there were times when he thought to himself that death would be the easiest solution of jinny's difficulties she was happy enough now in the little spare room at the presbytery but when she got well she could not of course stay there 
and though joe insisted that she must return to his house martha would probably make her life miserable if she did there seemed no way out of it it was almost to be hoped that jinny would die the puzzle was solved however in the most extraordinary and unexpected fashion by the discovery of no less a person than mr richard billington himself his last spree had it seemed proved too much for a brain at no time one of the strongest and he had passed the ten months which had elapsed since his disappearance in the county asylum where in christmas week he was seen and recognised by an honest farmer and his wife on visiting their lunatic son they described him as alive and well and except for a rooted conviction that he was the emperor of germany and an unfortunate disposition to bite every one who refused to pay him homage as sane they said as they were the canon set off at once to make sure there was no mistake being accompanied by martha who was obliged to acknowledge the identity of her husband how his boots and waistcoat came to be worn by another man was a mystery which was never cleared up but there he was an incontrovertible fact so martha had to pay back the insurance money and to say good-bye to joe and to become mrs billington again she left thornley and returned to the town where she supported herself by washing and was much honoured and respected to the end of her days as became a woman with a grievance it was not merely the fact of being a grass widow with a husband in a lunatic asylum which called forth the sympathy of her acquaintances but to think that she spent all that money in burying her manners was no kin to her eh she had seen trouble poor soul joe bore up wonderful thornley said and the children were out of their wits with joy as for aunt jinny she postponed her dying to an indefinite period and went back to keep house for them again and though she was stiff and rheumatic still it was wonderful how much work she managed to get through soon the episode of joe's second marriage was remembered only as a bad dream but jinny never laid her down a neats without breathing a prayer for all poor folks as has no home of their own End of chapter 7chapter 8 of in a north country village by m e francis this librivox recording is in the public domain on the other side of the wall the park wall of thornley hall forms a background to the village and the wood on the other side is a very paradise to the children in the long spring evenings a dozen or so may often be seen scaling this boundary wall and with a careful twist of their little persons for there still remain some fragments of broken glass on the coping and a flourish of arms and legs disappearing one by one then begin birds nesting and fern collecting and flower gathering and a score of other delights all the sweeter because forbidden if a keeper comes in sight or a gardener or a member of the family there is a sudden stampede and in two minutes lo and behold nothing is to be heard or seen but a group of urchins innocently playing marbles in the village street on principle i am of course opposed to anything which savours of trespassing but still i must own that if i were a little village boy i should find it hard to keep out of thornley woods indeed even as it is i fear i spend many an hour in their enticing shade which should be more profitably employed birds nesting never did possess any charms for me and i like to see the ferns and flowers growing where they list better than gathering or transplanting them but certain emotions and enthusiasms wake within me as i stroll under these branches which make me tolerate and even sympathise with little freebooters in corduroys i confess that my heart beats as i prowl round likely bushes and of a sudden with a shriek and a flapping of wings a blackbird or a thrush flies into my face there is a nest and there the tempting eggs warm from her breast one can understand the itching of schoolboy fingers to lay hold of them in the entrance of a disused rabbit hole low down in a mossy bank i know of a pair of robins built once and many a time did i kneel in a rather muddy ditch to peer into their curious dwelling place the little palpitating mother sitting on her eggs the while ay this is magic ground there is witchery in woodland sights and sounds and scents 
those rows of daffodils that take the winds of march with beauty how shall an urchin refrain from gathering an armful of them is not a boy's will the wind's will but to me the long undulating golden lines are lovelier when unbroken there is abundance of gold here when the year is young here a patch of primroses there a very plain of celandine golden moss on ground and tree trunk a golden mist of opening leaf buds and golden sunshine over all ah that little water hen in yonder pool how she dives at sight of me her wee simpletons of chicks paddle distractedly over the spot where she has disappeared dipping their heads in imitation of her but leaving the rest of their minute egg-shaped bodies in full view a group of wild cherry trees stand near this pool and in the spring its waters are white with fallen blossoms late spring or early summer is the time to see thornley woods in their glory when their green livery is at its leafiest and the undergrowth of rhododendrons is ablaze with blossom the white and pink and crimson of the cultivated varieties contrasting with the more plentiful lilac of the wild ones some of these have spread to be very trees with twisted branches and a thickness of trunk under their shining green which testify to their age yet year after year the blossoms cover them fresh and young and sweet laughing children climbing round the old stock up this beaten path to the right one can get a glimpse of the hall not a very imposing building perhaps with its low frontal and irregular architecture a wing here a tower there windows at uneven levels the very stones where the ivy lets them be visible of every conceivable shape and size but if these stones could cry out what a tale they would tell many a curious drama has been enacted within those old walls and many a strange vicissitude have they witnessed certain of the records treasured in the squire's study yonder tell us mournful and curious histories of the struggles it cost those stout old ancestors of his to cleave to their traditions as catholics and jacobites one may imagine how many storms they weathered and how often ruin must have stared them in the face banished as they were and imprisoned and fined but they held on their way still clinging to their ancient manor while their people clung to them to this day the bond between squire and tenant is almost unique in its strength the thornley people are shrewd and rugged and hard-headed enough the last in the world to be accused of truckling to the higher powers but they love and support their squire because he belongs to them and they understand each other their fathers did the same by his father and the bond can be traced backwards for many generations perhaps no stronger proof of the harmony of relations between landlord and people can be cited than the fact that there are few leases on the property most of the tenants holding their land by virtue of a verbal agreement thornley possesses its own local board and levies its own rates aye and discusses them hotly the squire arguing from the chair the members growling forth their opinions as they sit round the board everything is on a free and friendly footing at these meetings a very good footing which is more than is ever likely to be afforded by their roads but now it is time to say a word or two about the lord of the manor himself a fine old english gentleman indeed but not of the hackneyed type none of your drinking brawling swearing ruffians who are frequently cited to us as samples of the old school there is never a foul word to be found on his lips or an ungenerous thought in his heart he will uphold his dignity on principle and is tenacious of family traditions but he would not think it beneath him to shake hands or exchange jests on occasion with the poorest of his labourers and he can do a day's work still with the best of them watching the tall burly figure upright still in spite of its seventy odd years looking into the kindly open face hearing the cheery voice one realises the magnetism of his influence over a people staunch and sturdy and jannock as himself see him now with coat and waistcoat open and axe on shoulder he has been thinning out the undergrowth of elders in the woods indeed as the people say squires allus a gate at summat all country pursuits are delightful to him he is of course a sportsman from the crown of his fine old white head to the soles of his thick shooting boots 
and an adept in woodcraft of every description and is besides a clever gardener and carpenter he has indeed a carpenter's shop of his own where on wet days he spends hours working with as much zest and earnestness as though his living depended on it the real joiner's shop yonder near the farmyard is also a favourite resort of his and hardly a day passes that he does not visit the queer old brace of carpenters at work there these can hardly be included among the hangers-on of whom there are so many at thornley when an old workman begins as he says to wear away and is no longer equal to much exertion he becomes what is called a handyman and is kept in heart and in pocket by the daily allotment of nominal tasks these are sometimes a little difficult to find but the self-respect of the poor old fellows who accomplish them is not wounded as would be the case if they were offered money which they had not earned so they paint gates leisurely and without too much attention to detail and salt bacon and occasionally trap rats one old gentleman indeed became such an adept in the destruction of this class of vermin that no one ever called him anything but billy rat i fancy that at last he himself would have found it difficult to recall his gradely name a queer wizened up knowing looking little fellow was billy regarded by the village children with wonder and awe for his method of exterminating rats was mysterious not to say uncanny he did not trap them or hunt them with tarriers or poison them at least not with ordinary rat poison he just laid down an innocent looking preparation of his own and the rats disappeared after billy's dealings with them never a rat was seen or heard or stranger still smelt about the place but he guarded his secret jealously and would reveal it to no one it eventually died with him and the plague of rats has now returned to thornley the old carpenters before alluded to however are still equal to their full day's work and receive their full day's wage though the youngest of the pair is seventy and the eldest the patriarch of the village the latter joseph birch is a tall lean old man with marked features and a curiously pallid complexion he is almost blind and to conceal this fact wears his hat tilted over his worst eye with a rakish air at variance with his rather serious face and manner his defective sight is a sore point with him and he is much put out if any one is ill-advised enough to notice it while he hastens to cover by laborious explanations any chance awkwardness on his own part which would seem to betray it i would just be thinking me cellar summat and didn't chance to see ye he remarks when he has perhaps violently cannoned against you and then staring in the direction from which your voice proceeds he will tell you that you're not looking so very well to-day and ask how's that having by these precautions recovered the ground lost by his false step he shambles on again and when he thinks you're out of sight puts out his hand cautiously and feels his way by the wall one comfort is he observed once in a moment of unusual confidence squires never found out as they were all to miss the little fiction of the perfect clearness of joseph's vision is indeed kept up by the master with quite as much perseverance as the man do you see the squire says pointing out some defect or describing some wished-for alteration in the job on hand and joseph puts his head on one side and scratches his jaw meditatively and remarks that he has noticed that himself or that indeed he has unbethought himself about it and doesn't seem to fancy the looks of it as it stands he is a first-rate carpenter in spite of his affliction and his work planned and measured as it is entirely by touch is neat and solid his brother craftsman the youngster of seventy already alluded to is looked on by his chief and most of their fellow labourers with a kind of half pitying contempt his youth to begin with is against him and besides he is a newcomer and comparatively a stranger having only worked on the estate a matter of thirty year or so why many in the place can remember the day he came tramping from cheshire with a bundle under his arm looking for work that alone it is owned by even the friendliest of his neighbours would make a body think different it's true he comes of a different stock it is said and was even then a clever artisan but there's allus a kind of feeling you know 
when ye don't know a man's folks and where he's comed from and that so robert is tolerated and patronised and occasionally put in his place and bears it all with exceeding good humour he is a small slight wiry man bald and white and toothless and to the full as deaf as joseph is blind joseph is very kind and magnanimous about his subordinate's infirmity though sometimes he is obliged to comment on it and he whistles to robert when he wishes to attract his attention and makes elaborate and extraordinary gestures to illustrate his meaning in a compassionate and condescending manner yon poor lad can't hear you know says joseph and robert's little blue eyes look up twinkling and presently he asks respectfully did ye see the little bradall anywhere a few years ago another great crony of the squire's was alive old johnny was perhaps more devoted to his master than any one else on the estate but then as he said he had good reason to set store by squire he was a handsome stalwart white-haired old fellow who had begun life as a cowman and who to the end of his career was consulted by all the neighbourhood on knotty points connected with livestock on fine afternoons he might be seen enthroned on a big stone in the farmyard munching his baggin or smoking his pipe and giving audience to his clients a picturesque figure in his old-fashioned garments long-tailed coat blue knitted stockings clogs and breeches there was a story about those breeches which johnny would tell occasionally after a due amount of persuasion they breeches ah i set a dale o' store by they breeches and well i may they seem a good stout pair one of the listeners would perhaps suggest perfectly aware that this was not the reason johnny valued them but anxious to humour the old fellow by leading up to the point gradually ah they are that joe orrell has made em as all as good stuff i will say it stuff as'll welly wear for ever and look well to the last ah he's a pretty fair tailor is joe though it isn't so much his part o the business as i think the most on there's others as had a hand in the tailorin o these ere breeches i can tell ye ye wouldn't happen to think as squire had ought to say to them would ye now here his little audience would smile and nudge each other the story was coming now ah johnny would continue singling out with his eye any member of the group to whom the tale was genuinely new ye wouldn't think it but there this is how it were i were coming warm latish one neat a two three year ago now i'd been up yonder at granny gibson's seeing a pig as she had as were sick it were at the last poor beast and i towed her she'd better send for butcher to fetch it away and granny took it very well she's rail religious is granny the will of almighty be done says she and arter all the lord's good it might have been one of the lads well as i was saying i were coming warm latish and taking a short cut through the wood when all of a sudden i heerd summat creeping arter me sticks breaking you know and every now and then a sound same as a footstep i turned me round and looked and there was nowt as i could see so then on i went and the creeping and cracking went on too well thinks i this is strange and i didn't feel not to say comfortable for all the boggart tales as ever i'd heard come into my head and i'd half a mind to turn back and not to go through the old burying ground as lays there you know just at the corner of the wood folks as pass by there o nights tell queer tales but if i'd gone back i had to pass yon thing whatever it were as were following me so that stopped me again well i gave another look round it were getting reet dark but i thought i saw a shape o some mack under the trees that was enough off i set running as hard as ever my poor owd legs ud take me and if the thing didn't begin running too i durstn't look round again but i could hear it plain well i knowed they weren't no use in my thinking i could run faster nor it but i bethought myself all at once a thowd cross in the middle of the burial ground and says i if i can but reach yon no boggart as ever walked can come next to nigh me there it were and there was i sweating to get to it and yon with the boggart 
coming arter me fast. I clomb up the mound with the boggart behind me and catched out of the cross. And if the big stone top doesn't give way, down I comes faster nor I got up with it atop of me and me two legs broke. Pause, during which Johnny looked triumphantly round, enjoying the sensation. Well, he would resume presently, I were knocked a bit silly at first, as ye may think, but when I come to, there was a leap flashing in me eyes, and Squire and Bob Prescott bending over me. Eh, hey, Johnny, Johnny, says Bob, however could I guess it were you? Why didn't ye holler, says he? In all the fifty year as I've been keeper here, I never see such a piece of work as this. Where's the boggart? groans I, as well as I could, for the pain in my legs was awful. Did you take Bob for a boggart? says Squire. Eh, hey, man, says Bob, I took ye for one of their rascally poachers. And he were fair crying, poor owd lad, thinking he'd done for me. Come, Bob, says Squire, pull yourself together, get someone to help us carry this poor fellow home, he says. His legs are broken and must be seen to at once. Eh, hey, squire, don't ye trouble yourself, says I. I'm done for. I am that. Keep up your heart, old chap, says squire, and he sits down aside me with his pipe in's mouth and looks at me. Keep up your heart, old chap. You're pretty tough, you know, Johnny. We'll have you about again in no time. Well, arter a bit, a lot of lads comes for the village, and our missus with em crying fit to break her heart come come molly says squire he's not dead yet twon't be long first though says the lads as were shifting me eh hey, i thought i should have died upon the road but when they geet me home and laid me o the bed squire come and stood aside o me now says he there isn't any doctor at hand johnny so i'm going to do what i can for you myself it's very good o you i'm sure squire says i groaning awful but i doubt it's scarce worth your while i reckon i'm undee nonsense says squire a broken leg or two never killed a man yet ah that's what he said a broken leg or two now let's see says he these breeches'll have to come off and they're such a beautiful tight fit you're such a dandy johnny you know we can't pull them off eh hey, lord says i all of a shake at the notion don't go for to do that, squire. Cut em, cut em to pieces if ye like. I'll never want em no more. Johnny, don't be wasteful, says squire, as cool as a cucumber. A good, stout, serviceable pair of breeches. Of course you'll want them again, and you'll be very sorry if they're spoilt. Then he whips out his knife and looks across at the missus. Don't be frightened, Molly, says he. I'll do no damage. And if you'll believe me, he slit down the seams that careful, you know, stitch by stitch, and me hollering all the time as twert no use is taking all that trouble, and to a knob at a wooden suit as I wanted now, meaning the coffin, you know. Squire never tax no notice, and goes on just same, and when he'd done, he hands over the breeches to our missus. There now, he says, you can sew em up again, and they'll be ready for the gaffer when he gets about. Well, he'd done it as clever, the old woman said, as she could have done herself. Never so much as a thread of the stuff cut. Then he hunts up lathes and handkerchers and that, and sets me legs for me. And here they are, reet enough, breeches and legs too, as good as new, I may say. Here, Johnny used to stretch out his nether limbs and gaze at them affectionately, ejaculating half to himself, Squire's handiwork! There was universal regret when the quaint old figure disappeared from our midst. Johnny had been repairing a certain fence which he was anxious that the squire should find in good condition on his return to the hall after a short absence, and worked so eagerly that he caught a chill. For two or three days he lingered, dozing a good deal, and sometimes wandering, talking chiefly of his work, as these simple, toilful old folk do. He fancies he's about yon fence still, whispered his daughter between her tears, and Johnny went on drowsily chopping wood and hammering nails, 
gesticulating with his big feeble hands and muttering half-articulate comments on his fancied labour there we are reet yon's too short i doubt a plague upon those nails there now we get in it and then he fell to plucking at the sheet and was silent silent so long and so absolutely that his children grey-haired men and women some of them and his children's children who had gathered round his bed looked at each other inquiringly he's gone said one at last but not yet his eyes opened once more and travelled round slowly and a smile crept over his face i mun see and get her fettled up afore squire comes home he said and then closed his eyes with a little sigh and went home himself End of chapter 8chapter nine of in a north country village by m e francis this librivox recording is in the public domain little paupers all the chubby rosy little people who may be seen flocking to thornley school are not natives of the place there is a floating population of boarders out workhouse children billeted here and there in the village by the union they are principally girls for the thrifty thornley matrons value the hand's turn they can get out of them occasionally quite as much as the bitter money that they receive for their keep but now and then a farmer or a cowkeeper finds a pauper lad come in useful for driving a milk cart or cleaning shippens or performing odd jobs that it seems a pity to pay out wage for it is only fair to say that as a rule these children are exceedingly well fed and well treated but nevertheless there is and always will be a certain distinction made between little isaac and little ishmael thus while the child of the house is free to play by the roadside after school the workhouse child must come in and scrub a floor or clean the pots and pans here and there their meals though the same in quality as those of the rest of the family are partaken of at a separate table and at christmas time when there's dancing and tea-drinking and merry-making all over the place the little boarders out are left behind the canon usually gave a consolation party for the pauperines as he called them there was joy and triumph the proud sisters had perforce to stay at home and the little cinderellas went to the party and the canon poured out their tea and stuffed them with cakes and told them stories and played the piano for them to dance to altogether there was no end to the rapture and the glory jack davis was a workhouse boy who had been brought up at thornley from the age of two his master farmer morris calculating that he would be big enough to work by the time his companion pauper a lad of eight was too old to be paid for by the union some people laughed at this foresight of farmer morris's and reckoned the brat would do more damage than his keep was worth long before any work could be got out of him but as time passed the village folk changed their tune for not only did his master find him useful but nearly every man woman and child in the place contrived to get a hand's turn out of jack now the little round-faced fair-haired lad would be seen driving in the cows for mr waring now running to the shop for granny gibson or to the pump with polly birch's kettle or to some distant field with joe rutherford's baggin and now toiling along the dusty road which led to upton bent almost double under the weight of an overflowing clothes-basket while its rightful owner sauntered leisurely in the rear gossiping with a friend the women rewarded him with a there's a good lad the men with an inarticulate grunt at the end of his journey and little jack would look up brightly and wipe his brow with his jacket sleeve and start off at a brisk pace to see if he was wanted anywhere else there never was such a good-natured good-humoured willing urchin as jack davis everybody liked him and everybody made a drudge of him the little beast of burden as the canon called him was so ubiquitous so obliging so prompt so blithe that it was almost impossible to avoid taking advantage of his anxiety to make himself useful who's to fetch that parcel of books from the station the priest would ask perhaps oh jack davis said he would go after school the mistress would reply as a matter of course did you jack i thought my housekeeper was sending you in the opposite direction for some eggs 
then jack would stand up extending his little red paw as a sign that he wished to speak his blue eyes jumping out of his head with eagerness please canon i can easy do both afore milking time milking time echoed the canon with his kindly laugh i had forgotten mr waring's cows poor little beast of burden he knew there was nothing which offended jack more deeply than to refuse his proffered services or indeed to neglect to ask for them when required once jack had cried for a week because the canon had omitted to tell him he was setting out on a journey at five o'clock in the morning and the child was too late to carry his bag to the station on the next occasion jack made sure of him by sitting on the doorstep of the presbytery all night with this general amiability jack was so diligent at his lessons so punctual in coming to church so pious so honest so painstaking that sometimes the canon would shake his head over his excessive goodness it can't last he would say i know it can't last he will either die or take to courting but years went by and the union left off paying for jack and mr morris began to pay him the very smallest sum he could decently offer him and jack went on working for him and everybody else and grew a little taller and a good deal broader and by and by a sort of flaxen fluff appeared on his upper lip he would very soon be a man and yet so far the alternatives dreaded by the canon seemed equally remote one sunday afternoon however the canon happened to be strolling along a lane in the neighbourhood of the village when he came suddenly face to face with jack and a young lady a very smart young lady though up to the last two years she had been a pauperine she was now a servant at one of the farms at upton and in the receipt of sufficiently high wages to enable her to wear a locket with a blue stone in it and a hat with a pink feather i'm not quite sure if she was leaning on jack's arm or jack on hers but arm in arm they were and apparently on most affectionate terms the canon stood stock still in the middle of the path and gave them one of his terrible looks john davis said the canon and margaret lunt what is the meaning of this john davis stood motionless his eyes goggling and his face turning from red to purple and from purple to white margaret lunt sobbed and choked and coughed and then putting her finger and thumb in her mouth took out a large bull's eye please canon he's my young man she observed diffidently indeed said the canon and then he turned to jack but found it difficult to preserve his gravity as he descried the outline of what was evidently a companion bull's eye clearly defined in the youth's cheek steadying his voice he resumed with becoming severity john i am surprised at you how often have you heard me speak about the folly and more than folly of such behaviour as this do you not know that i always set my face against this this senseless love-making which can never come to anything please canon returned jack speaking somewhat inarticulately partly on account of emotion and partly on account of the bull's-eye please canon we was coming to see you coming to me what for jack nudged maggie who as a rule was more glib with her tongue than he but on this occasion she was so much overwhelmed with bashfulness that she could only hang her head till the canon observed that the pink feather was fastened at the back of her hat with a very large and crooked brass pin well he asked after a pause maggie nudged jack and murmured indignantly go on can't ye canon said jack i take it rather hard that ye should sauce us for what's nobbut reet maggie and me's made up our minds to get wed and we was just coming to ax ye if ye'd put us up next sunday the bands ye know here the would-be bridegroom came to a sudden stop owing to the bull's-eye unexpectedly tumbling out of his mouth he looked down at it as it rolled along the path and then put his foot on it much as if it had been a beetle bands said the canon struggling with a violent inclination to laugh and bull's-eyes how old are you jack very near nineteen responded jack with somewhat sulky dignity and as for their bull's eyes i dunno at max so much count of them it's maggie as was that set on my trying one the woman gave me and i did eat muttered the canon and he laughed outright 
the whole story so you are fond of bull's eyes maggie there don't be afraid hold up your head i don't at all find fault with the bull's eyes i only object to the bands how old are you maggie i'm turned sixteen whispered maggie faintly oh children children said the canon laughing again but presently composing himself he sat down on the bank that edged the road and looked at jack who somehow did not seem so crestfallen as he expected what are you going to marry on he asked more seriously how do you propose to live you both only earn a few shillings a week besides your board and when maggie gives up her place she will of course lose that and even if mr morris continues to employ you which i doubt i am quite sure he will not give you wages enough to keep a wife on no no it's absurd for either of you to think of marriage for several years to come and meanwhile there must be no talk of keeping company understand that canon said jack much wounded but still dignified it's just because i do understand that i were coming to ye i'd never have gone for to say a word to maggie without i had it all settled her and me's going to live in town when we wed i've the promise of a job down at the docks and good wage they give too and i've seen a room as'll just suit us and we's do very well why should we wait she's no one and i've no one if ye won't do the job yourself we can get married at upton but i never thought added jack with tears starting to his eyes i never thought as it'd be any one but our own canon as a he paused too much moved to continue the canon was a little overcome himself for he was very fond of jack and besides being sorry to part with him he could not but see that this was a foolish business and would probably end in misery the mere thought of these youthful simpletons exchanging their healthy happy country home for a room in some slum near the docks was in itself a source of anxiety and then marriage before the bridegroom was nineteen beginning life on the promise of a job it was deplorable nevertheless in spite of everything he could urge jack stuck to his point maggie and he would take their chance but get wed they would and if canon wouldn't shout them next sunday they would go to upton you are a couple of geese said the canon getting off the bank at last but if any one is to marry you it shall be myself shouted they accordingly were on the appointed day to the intense amusement of thornley which was unanimous in voting them a pair of noddies as neither of them had any relations that they knew of nobody gave them anything except good advice of that they received enough and to spare though the sum and substance of it all might have been condensed into one famous word addressed by mr punch to people in their situation but they would and they did though presently thornley growing quite irate at their pig-headedness said some severe things and uttered gloomy prophecies farmer waring going so far as to tell jack that he needn't come looking for help there when he and his wife found themselves beggars i'll clem first cried jack with an angry flash in his eyes it was the only time he lost his temper up to this he had received advice remonstrances and reprimands with imperturbable good humour but this remark cut him a bit as he subsequently observed all the same on his wedding morning he drove up farmer waring's cows for him as usual and filled granny gibson's kettle and fed mrs birch's pigs and then he changed his coat and went to fetch maggie to church maggie had expended her last remaining shillings on a lace collar and a pair of flesh-coloured silk gloves which had to be peeled off with great difficulty when the ceremony was about to begin jack wore his rather threadbare sunday clothes he could not afford to make any difference in his attire for though he had been saving for several months before he spoke to maggie his little capital was sadly diminished by the time he had purchased the ring and paid for the hire of a room and the few sticks of furniture that were absolutely indispensable nevertheless as they stood at the altar rails together the canon thought he had never seen so radiant a pair and when they finally walked off arm in arm he smiled and sighed together poor little beast of burden he said i wonder if he realises the weight of the load he's taken on his shoulders this time but after all they have youth and hope and health and love god bless my little paupers 
he watched them as they descended the church steps and walked down the path maggie's head nodding and the skirt of her dress giving a little kick up at the back at every step there was no giggling crowd waiting at the lich gate to deluge them with rice nobody had time or inclination to assist at this insignificant wedding no carriage was in attendance to convey them home according to thornley custom even if you only live fifty yards away from the church it's the proper thing to drive to and from your wedding no substantial meal was spread for them no jocular guests gathered round no health drinking anticipated jack had some slices of bread and meat in a handkerchief and maggie had gooseberries in a paper bag and thus provided they set off to spend their holiday in the fields jack was to start work on the morrow and this was to be their last day in the country so they were determined to make the most of it it was beautiful summer weather larks were singing overhead and butterflies flashing through the air and there were cuckoo flowers in the grass and marsh marigolds and water creases and fat stem blue forget-me-nots in the ditches once a big bumblebee came booming and blundering past in such a hurry that he nearly flew into maggie's face and she was frightened and clung to jack with a little scream what's to do mrs davis said jack which sally they both considered so exquisitely funny that they stood still and laughed till the cows and horses grazing in distant fields raised astonished heads and looked at them then they walked on sedately maggie resting her left hand on jack's arm and smiling complacently down at it every now and then she had not resumed her gloves partly because she was hot and partly because she was economical but chiefly because she could not see her wedding ring clearly through the silk after threading many fields and pausing to rest themselves on a gate they reached a range of sand hills bordering the seashore and came to a standstill beneath the steepest mound i mind said maggie with a half sigh of sentimental reminiscence how i used to roll down this hill when i was a child would you like a roll now said jack i'll shove you off from the top eh hey, lad how can ye talk such nonsense replied maggie bridling for shame of ye thereupon jack composing his features explained that he had only been joking and they climbed the hill with much sliding and laughing and screaming from the bride whose arm was nearly dislocated by her husband in his strenuous efforts to haul her along finally they reached the top and sat down panting and laughing still and when they recovered their breath they ate their dinner jack called maggie missus throughout this meal and maggie assumed pretty little airs of matronly importance but presently they got tired of being dignified and began to try who could throw the gooseberry skins farthest down the hill by and by a big steamer was visible on the distant horizon and jack explained all about it to maggie then a white-sailed schooner hove into sight which he also pointed out calling it a brig by the by in the far far distance a forest of masts were defined against the clear sky clear save for the light cloud of smoke which hung over them and the adjacent town yon's the docks cried jack nudging maggie and nigh to them's home lass home echoed maggie gazing at the mass and the smoke and the distant roofs and chimneys with eager ignorant eyes there was a delicious little breeze lurking somewhere near the top of that sand hill which went rustling through the star grass every now and then bending it into blue-green ripples refreshing to look at for the sun was hot enough to please jack and maggie and there was a little patch of wild thyme just beneath their feet which sent up new fragrance every time they pressed it the tide was in and gulls were floating on the edge of the water sometimes rising high above their heads with shrill screams and flappings of silver wings so the day wore away and at last the great pageant of sunset was enacted for these happy pauper children as they sat poised in mid-air upon their glittering throne of sand and as they watched the golden sky and the golden waters they felt themselves rich enough and when the sun disappeared and all the landscape was bathed in a mellow afterglow they went hand in hand together down the hill and into the wide world. End of chapter 9
of In a North Country Village by M. E. Francis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Here and There there has been a certain appearance of gloom overhanging the village during the last few days. The wheelwright, handsome, genial Robert Whitgrave, died on Sunday and was carried to his long home yesterday. Poor Robert, no one ever thought he would go off like that. It is true he was getting into years pretty well, and had grown-up children and half a dozen or so of grandchildren, but he was hale and hearty still, and could do a day's work with the youngest. On Sunday, just as he was smoking a quiet pipe in the garden before cleaning him for church, he fell down in an apoplectic fit and never spoke again. It was a mercy, sobbed his wife through her tears, that he hadn't time to put on his best suit. So they've been ruined for sure, for he fell reet again the pigsty. The Thornley folk are not sentimental, as has been before stated and see no incongruity in a widow's consoling herself with such reflections as these, even in the first keenness of her sorrow. But the sorrow is none the less genuine for its undercurrent of thrift. Thrift, indeed, so oddly associated with grief among these good plain-speaking village mourners, that sometimes it leads to results which almost take one's breath away. I remember once paying a visit of condolence to a poor woman who had lost her two sons, under peculiarly sad circumstances within a few months of each other. After many lamentations on her part, and expressions of sympathy on mine, I sought to change the conversation, and by way of raising Mrs. Wick's spirits, began to praise her tidy parlour, which indeed with its raddled floor, polished furniture and wealth of antimacassars and china, was the picture of what a cottage parlour should be. That is new, isn't it, Mrs. Wick? I said, pointing to a large mat on the hearth, very neatly made of strips of cloth fastened on canvas. Yes, ma'am, our Lizzie made it. It is very nice indeed. Where did she get all those bits of cloth? I suppose she begged the tailor for some odds and ends. Eh, dear, no, ma'am, returned Mrs. Wick, raising the corner of her apron to her eyes. It's the lad's clothes, ma'am. You see, we couldn't make up our minds to part with them, and it seemed a pity to let them go to waste. So our Lizzie, she took and made them into that, and it looks very well now, doesn't it? The wheelwright's yard is desolate enough today, with no bustling figure moving about it, no cheerful clinking and hammering sounding from the shed, and within a doleful party are gathered round the fire. Grief is still too new to permit poor Robert's womankind to set about their ordinary occupations, as they sit shaking their heads and looking gloomily at each other, while they recall various traits of the departed. The widow and her daughters sit at the table, the children of one of the latter perched awe-stricken on a bench in a corner, while Granny Whitgrave, Robert's mother, a prodigiously old woman, is in possession of a chintz-covered armchair in the ingle nook. The younger members of the family received the visitor after the first words of welcome with mournful and embarrassed silence, but Granny starts off in a quavering, piping voice, with garrulous lamentations and touching reminiscences, relating often and emphatically how poor Bob used to come in of an evening and say, Granny, he allus call me Granny, tak a supper gin, do, it'll do ye good, he'd say. Ah, he was that thoughtful the best son as a body could have. Tack a drop o' gin, he'd say he would. And so on and so on, till the new-made widow breaks in with a well-meant endeavour to cheer the old lady by inquiring, Who'd ever think as poor Robert had be took before her? We was all expecting her to go. Indeed, we knew very well that she couldn't last so long, and to think that after all he was took first. Here a fresh diversion is caused by the youngest of the children sliding off the bench in the corner and toddling up to its mother, laying a curly head in her lap and peering up shyly. "'Eh, you'll never guess what this lad's been playing all the morning,' says the mother, stroking his curls fondly. "'What do you think? Burying his grandpa!' The urchin laughs roguishly, and mother, aunts and grandmother smile too even the great-grandmother uttering a shrill cackle from her corner. "'Ah, ye wouldn't believe it,' pursues the mother, 
sinking her voice and winking towards me but there he dug a little hole so nice i the garden and fetched a little stone that was the coffin you know now pop him in he says she laughs this time and stoops beaming with modest pride to kiss the child they are all laughing in the house of mourning when i leave it even the widow in spite of her heaving bosom and swollen eyes a few doors lower down i make a visit of another kind a young couple live here newcomers from the south of england whose first child arrived on the very day of robert whitgrave's death very unlucky the neighbours told the young mother she has not been much noticed up to this being considered a parvenu and treated with the reserve which thornley meets out to such but when the poor thing was understood to be near her time and to be feeling lonesome and downhearted in consequence a few kind creatures felt it was but their duty to go and cheer her up a bit so they dropped in one by one and told her she looked real bad and it would be a mercy if she ever got over it nobody ever lived in that house they added the two last as had it died after a few months and quite young women too ah just about her age they were eh dear it was a sad thing when young women went and leaving children behind eh it was cruel sometimes though the baby went along of the mother particularly if it were a first child and happen in the long run that it was the best thing as it could do poor little thing what could a man do you know as was left like that we a child to do for well it was to be hoped as mrs summers had get on all right but poor soul it was no wonder she felt nervous and frightened did she hear that dog yowling last night a strange dog it were some people said you know as it wasn't for good when a strange dog came yowling through the village it was for a death you know so the saying went but there was no believing such tales as them but mrs polly birch will birch's polly she minded how once when she was a lass a strange dog a kind of a black and white greyhound it were come i the night to their place and run yowling round the house three times and then run off and her mother had said it's for a death i doubt and sure enough not more nor a two three weeks arter a letter come with a big black edge on it to say as her sister were dead ah well now mrs summers must keep her heart up and hope for the best did she never hear no noises o' nights nor see anything queer well it was to be hoped it was only mice or happen rats though rats was nasty things enough in a house sometimes if a body was ill o' that they got that bold they'd run over the bed they would ay and bite a person's toes but still rats were but rats arter all but margaret lupton the last as died i the house she used to walk a lot up and down this very room ay and stand for hours at yon gate when her breathing was bad she went off sudden at the end there were people in the village as said poor margaret was walking still and of a moonlight night some of the neighbours could often see something as plain as plain standing by the gate and some thought it were a calf and some a pony and some said it looked like a woman's figure but if ye went up to it ye'd find there was nought to be seen but people did get talking so foolish and mrs summers had no need to be afeard she must cheer up now and never go for to cry why that was the very worst thing for her and the little un as was on the road every one knew that and they'd look in again arter a bit to cheer her up ah they would for it was to be expected as she'd feel anxious and low-spirited poor soul these comforting assurances did not however exhilarate mrs summers as much as might have been expected and in fact it was not till her trouble was over and she could feast her eyes on her fine healthy little son that she at all regained her spirits she is sitting up in bed to-day and able to laugh at her fears i never got a bit of comfort out of my husband though she says he did nothing but joke and make fun of me what had spirits come back for he'd say haven't they room enough in the other world if they're well off they won't want to come back and if they're not they won't get a chance but he's very good to me every spare minute that he can find 
he comes running home to see if I want anything. It is lucky for poor Mrs. Summers that such is the case, for the neighbours finding that no catastrophe has happened, and that they are not called on to comfort a disconsolate widower, have, after one state call to inspect the baby, and assure the mother that it was not half the size of the ordinary run of Thornley infants, relapsed into their stately aloofness. But Mrs. Summers has got her baby to pet and gaze at and wonder over, wee fingers to curl round hers, tiny feet to hold in her hand, a small soft face in which to discover marvellous likenesses and beauties. Let the neighbours stop away if they like. Her baby is company enough for her. Next door to this house, where a little life has so recently begun, another little life, the life of a child, is rapidly ebbing away. Poor Gracie, not yet twelve and dying of consumption. I remember her such a merry, rosy little maiden, always tiny but so bright, so full of life. It makes one sad to see her lying thus quietly in her narrow bed, soon to be exchanged for one narrower still, but she calls up a smile at sight of me, and beckons with her small wasted hand. She wants you to go close to her, ma'am, says the woman who looks after her. Gracie is a pauperine. She can't speak above a whisper. She wants to tell you something. I approach and bend over the little creature, catching the faint words with difficulty. Mrs. Francis, did ye hear as Canon has given me a grave? Eh, hey, she's so pleased, puts in a foster mother, smiling too, almost as radiantly as Gracie herself. She was in such a way, you know, thinking she'd have to be buried by the parish. These union childer, you know, when anything happens them, they generally fetches them away, and poor Gracie was fretting so about it. But Canon, when he heard of it, came and said, No, no, Gracie, we won't let them take you away. We'll find room for you here, he says. I'll make you a present of a grave. Yes, says little Gracie, nodding feebly. That's what he said. I'll make you a present of a grave. And will you come and look at me when I'm laid out, Mrs. Francis? I promise, and Gracie smiles again with entire satisfaction. I'll pray for ye as soon as I get to heaven, she whispers after a moment, closing her eyes. I think they'll be tired hearing about Thornley when Gracie gets up yonder, puts in the woman. I don't know who she isn't going to pray for. Canon and Squire and the young ladies, and Mrs. Francis. And childer, interpolates Gracie. Aye, she says to me this morning, I'll ask God to bless Mrs. Francis's childer one of the first things, for she thinks such a dale of them. Well, then there's... I don't know who there isn't. Mother's leg, suggests Gracie, opening her eyes a very little. Oh, yes, my leg. You see, Mrs. Francis, it's always been a bit stiff like since I hurt it in the winter, but Gracie says she's going to settle about that when she sees Almighty God. She pauses to jerk away a tear or two and continues. Ah, she's settled everything, haven't ye, Gracie? She's given away a doll, and her new boots, and her clothes, and her prayer book. Our nanny's to have that. Mind ye careful of it now, she says quite sharp when she give it her. She set a deal of store by her prayer book, poor little soul. It's yonder, on the cupboard, interrupts the child. Show it to Mrs. Francis. I duly inspect and admire this treasure its former proprietress being particularly anxious I should observe that it has gilt edges and a clasp, and then the little dark head, which has been eagerly raised, falls back on the pillow again with a sigh. I only hope as Nanny will use it well. Ah, says the foster mother, following me to the door, you'll never see her alive again, Mrs. Francis. She's going fast. A question of hours, doctor says this morning. She was listening to him, and when he'd gone, she says, Well, mother, happen ye'll be having a good rest to-night. I have to be up and down a good bit with her a-nights, you know. And I'll be having a good rest too, says she, as she laughs. Afraid? Eh, hey, dear, no, ma'am. She's longing to go. It'll be a good job when I'm gone, says she this morning, 
for I'm a dale o' trouble, and it'll be lovely up there. I reckon the Almighty'll take me to-day, and you must have a good sleep, she says. Here the kind-hearted woman who is truly attached to her little charge suddenly bursts out sobbing and re-enters the house with her apron to her eyes. I pursue my way more soberly after this, for the recollection of Grace's tranquil smile brings a certain dimness to one's eyes and a choking sensation to one's throat. After gazing at that quiet little figure and stooping to catch that weak voice, it almost jars on one to see the troops of boisterous youngsters playing in the mud and to listen to their whooping and laughter. This sunburnt, well-grown lassie is just about Grace's age. I can hardly bear to look at her, though she's always been a favourite of mine. Curly, she used to be called, in allusion to her thick crop of yellow locks, which curled so tight that when one pulled out one at hazard, it sprang back into place again the instant it was loosed. These curls were rather a trial to their owner, because, though prodigiously thick, they were not long, and one day when she was a very little girl, she cut them all off and buried them in the garden, having been told by a waggish friend that this was the way to make them grow. My next visit is one of business. The village shoemaker has sent in his account, and as I am passing I may as well settle it. A very curious document is this yearly bill of his. He never will send it in oftener than once a year, the items being set down in a way which would puzzle the uninitiated. Soling and healing son's boots, two shillings and sixpence. Healing and toe-capping daughters, two shillings and ninepence. Daughters repaired, one shilling and sixpence. New lace boots, son, thirteen shillings and sixpence. Your button boots sold, three shillings and ninepence and so on for a column or two. In the next house there is also a question of a bill, the doctor having recently sent in his account for medical attendance on the family during an exceptionally severe winter. The children have all been ill, and the mother down for weeks. Medicine is included, and altogether the charge seems to an outsider reasonable enough, but I have to listen to many lamentations. I am told, indeed, that when the master opened it he nearly fainted, and when his wife saw it she fainted right off, and then her sister came in, and she fainted, and they took it over the way to Aunt Maggie, and she fainted. It was a terrible piece of business altogether. Doctors have not always an easy time of it in Thornley. To begin with, the patient's relations have an irritating way of supplementing their prescriptions with nostrums of their own. An exceedingly delicate infant will be dosed with cinder tea, or stuffed with bread and milk, because it seems, you know, to be always craving, the poor child in all probability suffering from violent indigestion. A man threatened with acute inflammation will be given a stiff glass of spirits to warm his innards, or to cut the phlegm. Then the question of remuneration is nearly always a vexed one, especially if, in spite of the doctor's utmost care and skill, the patient chances to die in his hands. Thus, when Polly Birch's child, having been taken out of its bed and carried across the road to a neighbour's, with the measles thick on it, unfortunately succumbed, it was thought very sharp practice on the part of the doctor to charge anything for his six visits. An old woman I knew once, who had been a martyr to asthma and chronic brown titus for the last twenty years of her life, was at length induced by a friend to call in a doctor, and was mightily indignant because he failed to cure her. She was sitting propped up with pillows, when I last saw her, feebly endeavouring to sew a black band on the hat which her husband was to wear at her funeral, and occasionally glancing round to make sure that her winding-sheet which had been in accordance with her injunctions, put to air by the fire, was not scorching. She had evidently given up all hope of herself, but made use of such breath as remained to her to inveigh against the doctor and his bill. Two pound ten, Mrs. Francis, and the time is been coming, and the bottles and bottles of stuff as I've drunk, and here I am, deeing. Opposite the shoemakers live a couple of washerwomen, mother and daughter, 
the daughter white-haired and wrinkled the mother inconceivably old bent almost double and totally deaf come in screams kitty who from the constant endeavour to make her parent hear has grown accustomed to raise her voice on all occasions to a startling pitch come in ma'am and sit ye down mother giving the old lady a playful push with one powerful arm and propping her up with the other as she totters under the impetus here's mrs francis come to see ye eh she'd been bad this last week mrs francis she have i thought she were done for on monday old marjorie catching the drift of the conversation from the expression of her daughter's face mumbles forth a lengthy history of various distressing symptoms entering into minute and rather appalling details with obvious pride and joy while kitty puts in a word now and then to endorse these statements and listens to the most harrowing particulars with every appearance of satisfaction she do ma'am ah ye wouldn't believe what my mother goes through eh hey, dear kitty says she last neat my inside's just the same as a band of music i told canon that's and says he wind instruments kitty i suppose eh hey, he is funny is canon wait till you see my mother's leg mrs francis you wouldn't really think it could be so bad you've been up to the hall haven't ye as i hastily interposed to change the subject and how's squire ah squire's my favourite and allus was though mr humphrey and mr edward is nice gentlemen too eh there is but a few of them left now no but three lads and two wenches miss monica has died last year in london she were the youngest at the family and she was gone sixty but eh squire allus was my favourite you've been seeing sick here in village i doubt poor robert whitgrave he were carried off sudden and his owd mother left she's the oudest in the village no but mother here i reckon they'll be next they two owd bodies mother'll go first i shouldn't wonder here marjorie judging from her daughter's smiling face that something pleasant is going forward smiles too and rubs her shrivelled hands together mrs summers is getting on nicely i observe ah so i believe you'll have seen mrs joe morris eh you haven't been yet eh well now really ah you going on there now well good afternoon come again soon mrs joe morris is a bride and should have been called on before she does not come from this part of the world and as joe did his courting rather hurriedly being anxious to get the business over before harvest time thornley has hardly even yet had leisure to discuss her it was a very great wedding to be sure all the thornley folk who were present were mightily impressed the bride though she would never see forty-five again was attired in white satin and her father a publican of some standing and anxious to prove himself well versed in the customs of polite society appeared in full evening dress eh it was gradely the village people said half a column of the fashionable intelligence of the paper published weekly in the little town where the bride's parents live was devoted to this wedding and it was really very fine reading quite equal to a paragraph in a society journal ornaments pearls the bride pronounced the solemn vow in scarcely audible tones the bridegroom in firm and manly accents honest old joe indeed saw no reason why his oi will should not be heard and understood by every one present or for that matter within a radius of half a mile or so i hear his firm and manly accents presently as i pass his farmyard resounding even above the hum and clatter of the threshing machine and as I stand on the neatly rattled doorstep, I hear the bride's tones, exceedingly audible now, objugating somebody who had omitted to sneck the door. My knock, however, produces instant silence. There is a good deal of running backwards and forwards and whispering, and after a few minutes a servant appears, who ushers me into the best parlour, and inquires in the most approved style, What name shall I say? though as i have seen her scores of times when she was attending school 
I fancy my face must be as familiar to those round eyes of hers as the steeple of Thornley Church. But she has been carefully drilled and must do credit to her instructress. After a quarter of an hour's conversation with the latter, I take my leave. It has been rather fatiguing work, as I have had to originate all the remarks, receiving merely monosyllabic replies. We are most genteel, both of us, but on the whole I prefer the ordinary style of conversation at Thornley, about ailments and babies and pigs, and how I myself am not as young as I used to be, and how they hope I'll not take it amiss, but really, I am sadly warsening. A body couldn't but notice it, that kind of stoop now that I seem to be getting. But, eh well, we're all getting on, aren't we? End of chapter 10「Chapter Eleven of In a North Country Village by M. E. Francis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Our Joe. As old Harry Lupton wended his way homewards on Christmas Eve, he began to think seriously of writing to his son in America and desiring him to come back to England forthwith. Every house in the village was astir with preparations for family gatherings. Here and there, indeed, were travellers already arriving sons and daughters home from service, or snatching a holiday from business in the neighbouring market town. Some, and these were not the least welcome, brought only little bundles in their hands, but others carried hampers filled with good things, at sight of which there was a fine outcry among the small fry in the household, and others again dragged little tired children slowly along, or bore them in their arms. Then, when the door was opened, and Grandma's cheery wrinkled face peered out into the night. What jubilee there was! How Billy was promised a treacle butty immediately, if he would give over his fretful wail! How much Nelly, bless her heart, was declared to have come on, and what a marvellous likeness was discovered between the new baby and its father! Harry Lupton, picking his way over the cobblestones slowly enough, for his lumbagi catched him awful, and his legs was none so strong as they were, noted all this bustle, and there came a mist before his eyes, other than that of the gathering dusk, and a chill about his heart which was not caused by the fast-falling flakes of snow, or the cutting evening wind. When he turned up the little dark lane which led to his cottage, the last in the village, and a couple of hundred yards away from any of the neighbouring homesteads, he was obliged to stand still for a moment and cough. There was such a disagreeable sensation in his throat, and pass his hand across his eyes. It's getting time for our Joe to be thinking o' coming home. Our Alice must write and tell him. Her and me's getting on. We might be in with graves next Christmas, and then there'd be no use in him coming at all. I'll bid her write, I will. He nodded confidentially to the hedges, and toddled on again, his tall bent figure and feeble gait pathetically endorsing his words. In a few minutes he had reached his abode, a queer little two-storied cottage built of yellowish stone. Light shone through the small paned windows, and a cheerful glow irradiated the figure of the old woman who stood on the threshold. "'Eh, hey, you're awful late, Harry. I couldn't think whatever had come to ye. You're back that bad and all.' "'Come in, missus, come in, and shut yon door. There's wind enough to blow the teeth out o' your head, if you had any, that's to say. Come, that's better.' Coffee smells first rate. Off with the clogs. Help us into the cheer, missus. Eee! It do come same as a knife in a body's back, that plaguey sciatic, when one goes for to sit down. There, all's well as ends well. Now, the bacon and the toast. There, I'm feeling a bit better now. He drew his elbow chair nearer to the fire and fell to at his supper, a brighter expression coming over his face and his melancholy thoughts banished for the time. Indeed, it would have been hard to feel melancholy in that cosy little kitchen, while the firelight danced so cheerily over the creamy walls and well-rubbed furniture, and brought to view such a wealth of brilliantly coloured crockery, and so many glittering pots and pans. Mrs. Alice Lupton had nothing to do but keep the place clean, and was scrubbing and rubbing and polishing from morning till night. Her own figure was very pleasant to look at in its tidy north-country dress. She was a pretty old woman, good-tempered and thrifty, 
and any one seeing her as she sat smiling at a good man from the opposite side of the fireplace would have felt that he was rather to be envied than pitied after a few minutes however he heaved a deep sigh and laid down his knife what's to do wi ye asked alice anxiously i've been thinking a dale of our joe to eat missus and i was saying to myself as it were getting time for him to be coming home you might write him a line and tell him as his father said so well master returned mrs lupton rubbing her nose reflectively i don't altogether know if we didn't ought to let the lad bide till he comes of hisself you see every letter tells us as he's doing pretty fair and that and happen it to be a pity to take him off's work just because we want to look at him let's see he's been a matter of sixteen year out yonder hadn't he he's a man now ay going on thirty-four he is and ought to a laid by summat a steady hard working lad same as he's been he ought to a saved a tidy bit enough to keep s feyther and mother in their owd age we're getting on missus ye that hearty still ye make no count at time but i'm getting past work and i say it's time our joe come and work for us there he hammered on the table with his fist and nodded at his wife in a way which betokened that he had said the last word on the subject she was pondering a little anxiously as to the advisability of carrying out his wish when there came a knock a rather a series of knocks at the door whoever can it be at this time at neat growled harry go and see missus i'm too crippled to stir mrs lupton left the kitchen and opened the house door starting a little at the sight of the man's figure which confronted her can i will you kindly let me come in and warm myself for a few minutes i'm drenched through and so cold and numb it's a tramping chap i doubt said alice in a whisper as she returned to her husband but it would be a charity to let him come in for a bit he looks for all the world like a ghost let him in then though i'm none so fond o tramps but christmas eve a body mustn't be too hard come in mister and sit ye down it's an awful neat the stranger entered a tall man who might have been good-looking but for the unhealthy pallor of his face the sharpened outlines of his features the stoop in his broad shoulders and the stubbly beard on his chin his clothes besides being ragged were soaked with melted snow and smeared with mud harry glanced at him with much disfavour and edged away his chair a little but alice fetched him a plate and presently desired him to comfort his inner man with bacon and buttered toast while she warmed up a cup of coffee ye'll have come a long way i reckon observed harry after a pause ay i've walked from liverpool and afore that i sailed from new york new york eh hey, dear that's where our joe lives cried alice eagerly i do wonder if ye ever come across our joe our son that is as has been there these sixteen years joe lupton from thornley did ye know him the stranger was silent for a moment stirring vigorously at his coffee and seeming to reflect joe lupton he said slowly at last new york such a big place i know a lot of english fellows let's see what was he like eh a tall slip of a lad wi rosy cheeks same as two ripe apples and hair that curly do you mind master how to twine round the comb of a saturday when our joe was a little un and i'd washed him in the dolly tub eh dear art he was a bonny child why missus a tall lad wi rosy cheeks what sort of a description's that chuckled harry they women they always thinks as time stands still our joe be a man now wi a fine pair of shoulders i reckon and a gradely beard to his face but i'll tell ye mister he had a pair of blue eyes bright and clear as could look a man straight in the face he had and an honest kind of a way with him as made ye feel he was a lad ye could trust did ye know any one of that mate yonder of the name of joe from thornley there was a silence for a little time again and then the man shook his head no he said i don't know anybody of the kind but you see he might be there and yet i mightn't come across him ah sighed alice deeply disappointed new york's a big place as you say is to place do you think where folks gets on ah that's it put in harry is it a place where folks makes much money the stranger broke into a short laugh oh ay 
money enough he said and buried his face in his cup didn't i tell ee cried old lupton nodding triumphantly at alice our joe will have saved a tidy bit eh hey, happen ye'll be riding to church in your own trap afore ye dee owd wench there was a sound as of a sudden explosion in the stranger's coffee cup at which lack of politeness his host was mightily indignant it's very fine for ye to laugh he remarked and yet there's naught to laugh at as i can see our joe's been working hard for sixteen year and i dare say he ought to have saved enough to keep as he comfort his mother and me he should come back he should missus you mun write and tell him that to-morrow ah sighed the traveller i'm longing sorely to see my old father and mother i'm homesick and yet i durstn't go home why cried alice in surprise while harry paused pipe in hand to look up inquiringly you see i i've been in a bit of a mess answered the man hesitatingly in fact i've seen a sight of trouble since i first went out yonder as a young chap i got into bad ways and fell in with a bad lot and the long and the short of it is i've just put in five years for burglary eh hey, dear heart ejaculated alice much startled harry half rose from his chair and stretched out his hand towards his big stick nay missus don't be frightened of me cried the stranger eagerly i swear i'd rather die than touch a hair on your head you've no need to reach for your stick sir he added turning to his host is it likely i'd tell you my misfortunes if i wanted to harm you i'm thinking of my own parents this blessed night and wondering if i'll ever have the courage to own what i've done and to ax their forgiveness his voice shook and he shaded his eyes with his hand eh dear heart said mrs lupton again don't they know then poor souls it'll go hard wi em i doubt it will said the man with something like a sob no they know nothing i kept it from them for i knew it'd go nigh to kill them you see they come of honest stock and have always held up their heads pretty high all the neighbours think well of em and respect em so i've always wrote as i was doing well and the chaplain yonder was very good to me and used to post me letters and bring me the replies they're but simple folk and never guessed as there were anything wrong god knows i'm loath to be the means of bringing shame to them now and yet i'm the only son they have alice clapped her hands together and rocked herself to and fro in her chair god preserve us what trouble some folks has eh what awful trouble i doubt they'll break their hearts when they come to hear the stranger held his peace for a moment old harry removed his pipe and stared at him with increasing dislike and disapproval i'm loath to bring shame to em repeated the man at last from behind his sheltering hand maybe after all it would be best for me not to go near em maybe i'd better go back where i came from and tell em nothing you eat there said harry sternly to my thinking ye'd best go away and keep away lad what for should ye go home to disgrace your father and mother in their old age them as is decent folks ye say to have the neighbours casting up at em as their son was a thief and was in jail five year why twould kill em straight off i shouldn't wonder nay nay go back where ye've come from and try to lead an honest life that's my advice ay returned the other almost in a whisper i'll go back and try to lead an honest life ah but i reckon your mother would like to see ye cried alice i reckon she would if it was ever so but men folks is different they're a deal harder and yet they can't bear trouble same as us twould go nigh to kill your feyther the shame and sorrow would happen ye'd best do as my master advises arter all the man's other hand went up to his face now and his voice sounded husky and unsteady as he said thank ye i will i'll go then dropping his hands he rose alice's eyes filled with tears nay but there's no such hurry she said and the neat's bad for travelling ye'd best stop here and go on in the morning ah there's the shippen added her husband rather unwilling and a good bit of straw ye might make shift on't for bed it's better nor the snow anyways thank ye kindly said the stranger it is so i'm pleased to have the chance 
his eyes which had hitherto shifted uneasily from one object to another while they were not bent on the ground now swept round the room with a long steady glance resting for a moment or two on the stooping figure of the old man in the corner he made a step towards him with hand half extended but meeting harry's severe gaze drew back and nodded instead alice lit a candle and preceded him out of the room carefully closing the door after her hark she whispered when they stood without you needn't sleep with the shippen when all's said and done there's a bit of room here near the stairs where our joe used to sleep i've allus kept it tidy and bed ready aired it seems to comfort me you know and i think to myself sometimes happen he'll come and surprise us some day and he must find all ready you can sleep there the master needn't know it was a queer little cupboard of a room into which mrs lupton ushered him containing just a truckle bed a chair beside it and a chest of drawers with a jug and basin on the top the man sat down on the chair as though seized with sudden faintness but his hostess was too busy with her preparations for his comfort to notice him little did i think as i'd ever let a tramping chap same as you sleep in our joe's bed but i'm sorry for ye and that's the truth i doubt ye took it hard o' my master to speak like he did but there men's ways are hard and my master is all they so set on honesty she had put on sheets and blankets smoothed and patted them and was now shaking a pillow into its coarse clean cover when she had finished and laid it in its place she suddenly stooped and kissed it turning and catching her guest's eyes and observing the strange expression of his face she blushed to her very cap borders i doubt you'll think me a queer sort of body she said but it's a way i've got whenever i come next to nigh this bed i allus think of our joe's bonny face as i used to see it morning and evening laying on this ere pillow and as i can't kiss that i kiss the pillow instead the man uttered a sort of groan and flung himself forward on the bed clutching the pillow with both hands and burying his face in it poor fellow murmured alice you're thinking of your own mother i reckon at this juncture harry's voice was heard angrily calling and the tap of his stick came across the floor of the adjoining room alice hastily extinguished the candle and crept into the passage artfully banging the house door as though she had just come in whatever have you been doing out of the cold so long cried her lord emerging from the kitchen in much displeasure i were but making yon poor chap a bit comfortable returned alice i'm none too sure as ye did reet to let him bide here at all said harry i don't so much care for folks o that mack about the place wish seems as if i could smell the prison off him slowly the heavy feet and the tapping stick passed the stranger's door he had heard every word the old man said and now burrowed his head yet more deeply into the pillow and groaned afresh mrs lupton excited and compassionate lay awake long after her master's snores made the very rafters ring and at last dropping to sleep towards morning was troubled by a strange and painful dream she thought she saw there joe a child again with rosy face and curly head and he stood without in the snow and wept and his father drove him from the door the vision was so vivid she saw the little lad so plainly with the tears on his chubby cheeks and his mouth drawn downwards in the pitiful droop against which so few mothers can steel their hearts that when she woke she could hardly believe it was not real twas we're moidering about yon poor fellow i doubt she said to herself and lay still the memory of her dream mingling with the thought of the tramp until she fell into a sort of waking nightmare in which it seemed to her that her son and the tramp were one presently she started up fully conscious and struck with a sudden fear a fear more terrible than that evoked by any nightmare which made her heart stand still and her hands turn cold what if they were one what if this tramping chap this jailbird were really their joe with awful clearness the stranger's story returned to her mind she went over it phrase by phrase word by word there was nothing nothing in his history which might not admitting the fact that it were possible for joe to have gone astray have also befallen him 
she remembered the tremulous speech the downcast looks the emotion of their visitor and the fear grew upon her and shook her very soul she sprang out of bed while harry snored on peacefully the dawn showed grey through the uncurtained windows and the wind whistled without she flung a shawl over her shoulders and pattered downstairs the boards icy cold to her bare feet the chill air that circled through the house seeming to penetrate even to her bones the door was ajar and through it was to be seen a vision of a desolate white world with never a living creature stirring only a long irregular line of hedge and trees standing out gaunt and black against a lowering sky alice caught her breath and leaned against the doorpost for a moment then supporting herself against the wall and breaking into a stifled piteous whimpering she crept into joe's little room lo it was empty the bed had not been slept in but the pillow was crushed and soiled and there in the middle where the mother's lips had touched it it was wet as though with tears End of chapter 11「12 of In a North Country Village by M. E. Francis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mates. The squire of Thornley, though willing enough to conform to modern ideas on certain subjects, retains to this day many old-fashioned notions with regard to sport. He will persist in looking at it as a matter of pleasure, not profit. Therefore, he never endeavours to make thornley shooting pay. He employs a certain number of keepers and rears a certain number of pheasants, and he and his friends shoot them at their leisure, and as many as are wanted for the house are kept and the rest given away. It never occurs to him to sell so much as a feather of them. A shoot at thornley is a pleasant business, even for the non-sporting members of the community. The bustle and stir, the tramping of heavy boots, the ecstatic barking of dogs, the hunting for somebody's flask, and the filling of someone else's tobacco pouch, the animated discussion as to where lunch is to be, the procession across the stable yard to the gun room, where the two chief keepers wait solemn and expectant, the gathering together of a little army of beaters. There is a certain excitement about it all, which infects even the most tender hearted of the ladies. Now for the guns. Billy, you old villain. You haven't touched mine since I used it on Friday. The barrels are like factory chimneys. I beg your pardon, Mr. Edward. I cleaned it on Saturday. You must have taken it out without telling me since. So I did, when I went after those ducks at the mosses. It's all right, old chap. Now, is everybody ready? We ought to have started ages ago. It will be dark before we know where we are. Is everyone here? Squire's not comed yet. Not here? No, he isn't. What is he doing? Do go and see what he's about, somebody. Somebody goes and presently returns with the announcement that the squire has not begun to put on his boots yet. There's a general groan. Then we shan't get off for hours, said one resigned voice, and the butt-end of a gun rings on the pavement. Consternation is painted on every face. Everybody knows what the squire's boots are. Presently a breathless messenger arrives from the house. He's getting them on, and then comes a girl jubilant. Papa's nearly ready. And finally the squire himself appears, sauntering leisurely along, placidly asserting that there's lots of time, and pausing as he passes the stables to strike a match on the wall, and to light his pipe in the most imperturbable manner possible. It is not that he is less than keen a sportsman than the very youngest of the party, but he is accustomed to look on time as an elastic commodity, and sees no reason why he should take the edge off his enjoyment by hurrying. At last he is under way. He's got his gun and his cartridge bag and his game bag. He's searched all his pockets to make sure that his matchbox and tobacco pouch are safe. He's sent one of his daughters to the house for his pocket handkerchief. He's discussed the prospects of sports with the head keeper, and patted the dogs and secured his own special favourite, a young black retriever by a stout thong to the belt round his waist finally just as the general impatience has reached fever height he remarks that he thinks it is about time to be moving and off they go the retriever straining at his collar 
and ready at the first rabbit which crosses his path to tow his master half across a field. The squire says this dog is half broken. He has one or two little pet theories of the kind, such as that the most infantine of the rabbits against which he wages unrelenting war on account of the damage they do to his holly trees, is three parts grown, and that any animal in the stables from the old hack on which all his girls have learnt to ride, to a three-year-old colt, is well up to his weight. The womankind return to the house. If the home coverts are to be gone through, one or two of the younger ones may presently follow the sportsman. I must own that my own enthusiasm never stood this test, or if the party is going further afield, we shall probably meet them at some farmhouse or keeper's hut with luncheon, hot pot being one of the standing dishes on these occasions. It is amusing, if one arrives first at the rendezvous, to watch the faces of the sportsmen as they come straggling in. One can tell by the first glance how the day has gone with them. The complacency of some, the depression of others, neophytes these. Easy unconcern marks the practised hand who couldn't miss if he tried, while the gloom of the fellow who let slip the only woodcock we saw would be noticeable even if the squire did not announce in a stage whisper one might as well take him out with a walking stick. Luncheon, however, revives drooping spirits and further invigorates hopeful ones. Anecdotes are told amid much laughter, and there is some good-humoured chafing, good-humouredly taken. Without, the keepers and beaters discuss various matters over their solid viands. Strong ale warms old Billy's heart and loosens his tongue. He relates certain reminiscences, recalling bygone encounters with poachers, with half-contemptuous comments on the softness of lads of the present day, which make one or two of the underlings hang their heads, and winds up with his favourite story of the last time the squire of Upton came to shoot at Thornley. "'He were a queer un, says Billy, towed squire of Upton. "'I never see such a one. "'He wouldn't never have no big shoots at Upton yonder, "'same as we've allus had here. "'He didn't seem to care to have parties of gentry stopping in the house. "'Nay, nay,' says the old squire, Fish and strangers stink out of three days. Eh, hey, he was a queer un. Well, one day we was Patrick shooting here, and he come out with us. He'd do that sometimes when he'd a mind, though he didn't care for other folks going over yonder. It were more to lot, and in the afternoon a storm come, with thunder and leetening, and a downpour of rain as drenched as afore we could get shelter. We was all making here and there, and nobody noticed we a squire of Upton had gotten to, but after a bit, when storm was ower, and we was all making warm as wet as water dogs, he nips out on us from a field of termits to the side at Thedge. Hallo, says the squire, stopping and giving himself a bit of a shake, for the water was running off him. Hallo again, says squire of Upton. You seem a bit wet, says he. I should think I was wet, says squire, aren't you? Nay, naught to speak on, says Towd gentleman, laughing to himself. You should have done same as me, says he. What's that, says the squire? Why, says the squire of Upton, I took off my clothes and sat on em. This story is received with applause and laughter, and then Billy, the other old keeper, relates how he caught that famous snig in one of the dykes yonder when he was a young un. Never was such an eel as that. It was caught about fifty years ago, but has been growing ever since. Each time Billy unbethinks himself about it, its length increases, and there is every reason to believe it will rival the sea serpent before he has done with it. Presently another voice strikes in. You'll have heard how Betty yonder at the lawn end is gone. Eh, is she? respond the hearers in different tones of regret. She were a kind of cousin of my own, adds Billy and a decent hard working owl body. You'll miss her going your round, Bob. Ye mind how she was allus sat aside at throwed, watching a cow and knitting. Ah, I do, replies old Bob, whose beat takes him past the lone end every day of his life. Poor owl Betty. Jim will be in a terrible way. She was near the end when I looked in yesterday, and poor owl Jim was patting her on the hand and telling her to keep her heart up. There was the two of them, lying one aside at t'other, and thou'd woman deein' fast, and Jim reaching ower her, and patting her, and axing, How are ye now, owd lady? Do you find yourself any more comfortable? And she deein'. Eh, 
poor owd chap's getting a bit silly says some one presumably the small farmer in whose house the party is assembled he's old you know and has been bedridden this many year eh twas the wonderfullest thing to hear him this morning arter the old woman was gone and they were talking a shifting her for twas a strange thing to have her theer lying aside her jim and she dead and where should they lay her out they was saying there is but two rooms in yon little house you know and alice the daughter sleeps in the only bed they have beside the owd folks you've no need to shift her at all says jim i can do wi her here he says i will not have her taken away says he and then he reaches out his hand and strokes her eh missus he says i'm fain to keep ye as long as i can they mun let ye bide to the last he says eh i thought it was the wonderfullest thing ah poor jim says bob i'm sorry for thou chap he'll be lost without his missus but i reckon he'll not be so longer arter her ay he'll soon be aside of her again responds billy and then there is a scraping of feet and a general move the midday meal is over in the evening the result of the day's sport is laid out for general inspection pheasants hares wild duck a few rabbits perhaps a water hen or two and with good luck for they're scarce in these parts a couple of woodcocks well the day is done and on the whole every one is well satisfied the gentry come in pleasantly tired to refresh themselves with tea or whatever their particular vanity may be the beaters and underlings melt away and last of all billy and bob turn their steps homewards one walking a little in front of the other according to time-honoured custom never was there a pair more truly attached to one another than this brace of mates though billy is tenacious of his prerogative as chief and bob takes his orders with becoming humility bob would as soon think of arguing with the head keeper as of walking alongside of him argument indeed or conversation of any kind does not seem to occur to either of them though they spend hours in each other's company except on the occasion of a big do when for the honour of the thing they are bound to exert themselves they are a taciturn couple billy is taciturn even in his cups as a rule though once he aroused the squire at dawn of day by throwing pebbles against his window and requesting him to come down forthwith and help him to rout a very army of poachers which he declared were overrunning the park billy had a great deal to say about these poachers town poachers they were he assured the squire and of the most malignant order even when the depredators turned out to be sheep billy's angry loquaciousness could not be checked but as a rule there never were such silent and cheerless sprees as those in which he periodically indulges he sits sighing and shaking his head at the fire and remorsefully fuddling himself day after day a most melancholy spectacle the objurgations of his wife are of no avail the remonstrances and persuasions of the canon fall alike unheeded squire is the only one who can get any good a billy under these circumstances and even he has to wait till billy is ripe for it i was much astonished once being still new to thornley and thornley ways when a stalwart youth in corduroys flew past me hastily observing to the canon with, with whom i was chatting outside the church porch that he was going for squire for favour a short time after the squire appeared pipe in mouth stick in hand retriever at heel and escorted by the anxious messenger on his way to lecture billy and in a few days billy resumed work very solemn and severe in manner if a little shaky about the legs i soon became used to this course of events during the periodical bouts of his chief bob takes refuge in a stolid affectation of innocence billy's not so well he remarks if questioned though every child in the place knows the reason of billy's indisposition and though bob makes a point of sitting with him in the evenings watching his potations with gloomy dissatisfaction but never offering to say a word once billy got the titus or brown titus as bronchitis is indifferently called in thornley while he was still weak after an outbreak and for a time was very seriously ill bob's distress was touching to witness he moidered billy's wife and occasionally irritated the invalid himself by his repeated inquiries and once when offered a glass of ale by way of consolation he heaved a deep sigh and observed that if his mate went 
he didn't care if he never got a wet again spoken thus with tears in his blue eyes and his weather-beaten old face all puckered with grief and anxiety this remark of bob's was genuinely pathetic however he has luckily not yet been called upon to become a teetotaler billy mended in course of time and bob follows his lead as of yore the old white heads are both getting rather bent and the broad velveteen clad shoulders stoop a little billy is going at the knees and bob drags one foot slightly as he walks one feels a little pang as one watches them joseph too told me the other day that he was wearing away and robert whose winter cough has been very bad of late made some jocular remark on the subject of his coffin which betrayed the bent of his thoughts the curtain has risen on the last act of this bucolic play and the chorus of old men's voices grows fainter as they make their exit one by one soon the drop scene will fall and the stage will be cleared for younger more energetic actors there is a certain likeness to their fathers in the new generation certain tricks of manner certain tones of voice but there is much that is strange yet a few years and it may be that thornley itself will be altered and modernized beyond recognition its old-fashioned customs forgotten its traditions stamped out the old order changeth and the fashion of this world passeth away but when the time comes for thornley to be improved and civilized may i not be there to see End of In a North Country Village by M. E. Francis